find out. You are live. They'll jump on. Live, and they'll jump on when we get around to it. If not. Okay. You want to do so, war chant? Yeah, hit that chant. We'll dive okay. right into it. That's quiet. Let's turn it up. There we go. Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. This is the Band Books Podcast, episode number 205, 6, 3, 203, <laughs> and as always we are your host Christopher Gillespie. Chillin' and willin', Maxton, relaxin'. And I am Donald Riley. Today we are going to get back into The Mystery of Christ and Why We Don't Get It by Robert Farrar Cop Coppin. Robert Farrar Coppin. Coppin. Robert, Robert, Isn't it Robert, a bird? Is it a? It's a bird, right? It's a capon. A capon. Yeah. I always think of capers, though. But since he's a chef, he would probably appreciate right. that. Yeah. You know, there's, there's always been, there's an ongoing argument, and those who knew him say that he <laughs> never actually corrected people. Oh, really? On the pronunciation? Yeah. He would just have fun with okay. it. Okay. And right. others I've heard, you know, it's pronounced capon, like the bird. And others are like, no, it's capon. I'm like, mm, I doubt it's capon. That's, that's far too inflected and not American enough. Hmm. So I go with Kevin. Yeah, and he probably just, you know, internally laughed every time. As, as someone who's spent his entire 49 years on this earth having people go, Dominic? Donald? Don? 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 Donovan? What? With an <laughs> like, A? Yes. With two A's? With O's? No, How many no O's? two O's. Yes, two O's, then two A's, <laughs> then, yes, then an I. Like my, I. In my own family, uh, my grandmother pronounced our last name differently than the rest of the family. Really? Yeah, she'd say Gillespie. Everybody else say Gillespie. How dare you? I mean, just come on. <laughs> it's her own name. Well, I mean, she I married in, but that's true. But still, <laughs> that's true. It's very true. Morning. How do you pronounce? Is it Bacakel? Bacakel. Bacakel. We'll just say it's Bacakel. And then there's Simon. <laughs> Simon. S -s 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 Everybody's Simon. checking in. They're saying the mornings. It's good. good morning. I hope that we're taking away from your work because Jesus said to leave your jobs and. Uh, get rid of all courts of law and follow him. So he did. Technically, we're doing our Christian duty. Yeah, he did. Leave everything and follow me. Yeah. Oh, I, the courts of law part. I was missing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't go to court with your brother. Reconcile. Oh, that's right. Yeah, he also said that you know to be about God's word all day, every day, True story. all day. Yeah, God yeah. Himself said that. Right. Which so, nobody gets uh, during voters meetings. When I'm like, you know, we just got done with like we we prayed a whole bunch an hour ago and. You know you can't overdo it, right? Like at a certain point, give other people a chance. But it doesn't really apply here. No. This is just a voters' meeting. That's true. Exactly, it's godless anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My council president yesterday told me he's like, "Don't don't announce voters' meetings anymore. Call them congregational meetings because then people will come." And of course, they don't want to have to make choices. I is laughed what... in his face and said, "I will, of course, Jim. I will do that." During announcements not, after church. Well, day. I tried the other thing. Let's call it a congregational assembly, right? Ooh. So it's not even a meeting. Yeah. It's an assembly. Nope. And like, well, but we just assembled around God's word. So I right. suppose. People, people might be um, not road scholars, but they're smart enough to know a bait and switch when they hear it. It's not a voters meeting. It's a congregational assembly. It's kind of like pastors saying this meeting is going to be short. Right. <laughs> well, I don't show up for meetings. That's how short they are. <laughs> <laughs> right. But if I say, oh, I'm just going to share a br few brief words with you, you know, and right. you're like, okay, what does that mean, actually? <laughs> like 20 yeah, minutes. Yeah, my counsel's like, hey, did you know you scheduled confirmation for the same time as our meetings? I'm like, did I? Wow. How'd I, how'd that one get past me? Weird. <laughs> oh, well, go on without me then. <laughs> so I send my wife in lieu of me to discuss things around the parsonage, which goes much better, actually, because... They don't, they're afraid to disagree with her. So, as well, they should be. Yeah, more gets done. Yeah. It's you interesting that uh, Steve can relate to this because Steve's a part of my church and one of my students is that now that I have these women from my church who are in Muay Thai and now spar regularly, their, their whole attitude has, has changed significantly and their ability to say no to things <laughs> has also Attitude in regards to men, regards to the church, just in regards to the way in which they comport themselves in their daily lives and in relation to things around the church. They don't just sit quietly well, in the corner and let other people I suppose I should do that again. Do their doing. Yeah. They actually raise questions and then say no to certain things and take responsibility for certain things. So I've got this like militia now of children and women in my church who at some well, you've point you've dreamt about 
you know, Prayed. living in. Okay, <laughs> dreamt, prayed. So, <laughs> all of the well, above. It, yeah. Well, we've talked about this. I mean, women coming alongside men, um, mm -hmm. you know, to support them in the work mm -hmm. rather than, if, you know, the what was I mean? That was the whole problem at the beginning. Is that you know the women would want to be the men and the men would want to be the women. And you're like, well, in one sense, men can't be women. There's well, many senses. Oh, There's but many they're ways. trying. <laughs> I guess future governor trying, of California. Trying. Well, that too. No, we talked about this, is the reason that there's not any men in church is because there's no men in church. So women have had to take over the responsibilities that are allotted towards men. What are you saying? And it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Men didn't push back. During the Industrial Revolution, when the church began the feminization and juvenilization of the church, men didn't push back. They didn't fight. Look back in the mid to late 1800s. Where's the men's movements that push back against the feminization and juvenilization of the church? Was it, I'll, I'll give you a parallel. I was listening to a podcast on Ovid and uh, his mm -hmm. metamorphosis and whatever. Oh, and, I uh, thought that I thought you were trying to be like witty about. No, actually, no, actually, Ovid. You know the, the poet, uh, Sharon or Miley Cyrus. No, 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 the Roman poet. <laughs> oh, oh, anyway, not, okay, not the woman. man. <laughs> no, and uh, <laughs> they had these women on the show, and they just like over and over like insisted that he was that he was patriarchal, misogynistic. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. they and they were trying to just only view him through this feminist kind of lens. Right. You're like, he's a product of his time. You're like, I, I mean, does it is he like promoting? They were saying he was promoting rape culture, and you're like, okay, this is Project really, much? yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like that, but then they're like, oh, but now feminist writers are are reclaiming of it, and they're they're drawing out the the positive, and they're ignoring the negative, and da 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 da. da. And the men on the show, of course, don't say anything. They're just mm -hmm. like, whatever, you know. I guess yeah. you're just going to have to just let you destroy this man's <laughs> reputation, you know, and he's, mm -hmm. he's a Roman poet. I mean, things were a little bit different then. And he's, oh, and they were saying that, like his depiction of the gods being rapists were like mm. wrong. I mean, it's like, actually, that's pretty much the history of Spot the gods. On. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is what the gods do. Yeah. You know, because they're the gods. <laughs> right. Right. And so if you're, if you want to suggest that humanity should operate differently, I'm all with that. You know, that's yeah. good. Uh, yeah, I know a God who doesn't rape people. If, you, yeah, if you're interested in him, him. Yeah. <laughs> I've met him. Yeah, met him. <laughs> he's a good guy. Mm -hmm. Worth it's, looking, it's, looking into. No, the absurdity of culture today and society, which rewards vice and promotes vice, is astounding. I was just some um, vice though, some vice. Right. Well, the, it's any vice that promotes victimization. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a and and, and alleviates responsibility, personal responsibility, and consequences. That's a good way to clarify that. Yeah. I was just listening to Jordan P. talk uh, in an interview. He talked about true friends, true men, hold each other accountable. Mm -hmm. They don't allow their friend, in this case, a very masculine relationship. You don't allow men who you call friends to do things that are destructive towards themselves or others because you love them, and uh, true friendship is seeing a person's potential out there in the future and walking with them to get to that. And so you are essentially there to keep them on the straight and narrow path so that they do attain glory and they do grow in courage and integrity and dignity and wisdom and all these other things. <clears throat> and then when you see them step off the path and start to do stuff that's self-destructed towards themselves or hurtful towards others and not engage in true justice and not stand up for the true victim, you're not actually behaving as a good friend if you mm, don't hold them mm -hmm. accountable for that. Whereas in today's society, we kind of give everybody a pass. Yeah. Even I, the people we call friend, we're like, well, you have to understand, he's, he had a rough day at work or you know what, he, he's not in a happy marriage, so we're going to give him a pass on the alcohol abuse or the, you know, he's abrasive. It's like, no, as a man, you hold him to account for being a man. Yeah, it's like you I can said do on better. this interview that I just did on Friday, that... If you look at the classical definition of a husband or a father, the two words that come up over and over again are defender and protector. And then you go look at the Greek word hero, and the meaning of the word hero means defender and protector. So there mm -hmm. is something integral to a father or a husband that is bound up with the definition of being a hero. Well, and I think this is one of the reasons why, I, you know, there's a lot of things I don't like about the invocation of the saints in the Roman church. Mm -hmm. Um, but the way that they elevated Joseph as protector, yeah. Yeah. I think is helpful, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, even though it, it, it's a little bit, um, 
I guess, mythological. I mean, because we don't know a lot from the scriptures right. themselves. Yeah. And yet we know, I mean, at least from the beginning of the story, that's what he did. He heard yeah. the angel. It's like, you know, I'm got to take care of my family. These, mm -hmm. these are the people, well, you know, God has given that, me. He decided to marry her publicly and then secretly. Well, again, her. needed a little bit of instruction from the angel again. But, a little bit. You know. Nonetheless. <laughs> Well, but even that, I mean, did, did seem to be like he was going to put her put her away quietly, right? Right. You know, do it. Put her it, away it is, quietly. That sounds like a mafia. <laughs> like a trying mafia to be as term. virtuous as possible right. in this. No, he wasn't going to. Joseph, what are we going to do with that plastic wrap and that shovel? I'm going to put you away quietly. <laughs> I don't think that's what it meant. But like a good fellow's reference. Nice. Oh, just we just watched John Wick with the boys. Him, so. And there's lots of and, well, you saran wrap in that. Yeah. That'll increase your testosterone count by like 500. Watching John Wick. So good. I think so. So yeah. good. And they they actually degrade in quality, I think, as they've gone. I love all three I of them. I wondered about that. The first one's the best. The second one's pretty good. And the third one, you're like, eh, it's kind of bloated now. Well, maybe as far as storyline, I, I think that's the key. Because the action, it, it gets more and more, mm -hmm. you know, dramatic. Bonkers. Yeah. Bonkers. Well, the third one's a video work. game. It's like literally he's going through the levels to get to the final boss. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> it's just straight up a video game. Um and yeah, the first one's kind of like a punk rock song. It's just like, just quick and dirty and just get to the point. Just bang, 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 bang. It's good. Yeah. It's I agree. timeless. You know what we haven't done on the show? And Talked maybe about we'll just do this, oh. do this for YouTube. Well, we'll get to that. All right. So 1517, our sponsoring organization. I there thought we, we should do this oh, at least right. once. Oh, that's right. We have to read that copy. Yeah. No, that's not that's not for a couple of weeks. Oh, we're um, doing but, that. Okay. But they actually have a publishing house. They publish books like this one. Oh, Cool. Crucifying Religion, Donovan Riley, yeah. link in the show notes. Um, I got a whole stack of them here. There's this one, Paul and the Resurrection. Mm -hmm. Testing Apostolic Testimony. It's short. This is a yeah. Pagan, right? Yeah, it's Pagan. And uh, it's pretty good just for a little apologetic right. book from Paul. All right. Uh, we have this one, Finding Christ in the Straw. This is from Hiller, who we know. Uh, mm -hmm. What's that one about? Uh, Epistle of James, or the Gospel according to St. James, I guess. That's what we'd say. <laughs> Faithless and Fearless. This is really boring, I know. But this is what we do. They have nice covers. I like that yes. part. Good design. Uh, blends current and New Testament thinking and research from fields of psychology, neurology, and social sciences to argue Jesus' physical resurrection from the dead. So another apologetic book, which they do quite a bit of. And then mm -hmm. we have The Pastoral Prophet. What's this one about? I'm asking you. Do you know? I have no idea. I, I, uh, There's so many the books. for other it's... people in my church to read. Should they so desire? Okay, this is the prophet Jeremiah. So it's a nice. commentary on Jeremiah the prophet. This one looks quite interesting. Hermeneutic on Romans. Nice. Right? How to, how to read Romans, right? Right. That's what a hermeneutic is. Uh, ragged. I would say that's a devotional for women, written by women, maybe. I don't right. know. I guess Gretchen is. You could read that. I want to say more about that. I got this one. Did you get this one? Yes. This is the yep. festschrift for uh, Hal Stinkbaugh, mm -hmm. who that's was right. one of my it's professors. Like a weeks ago. Yeah. And uh, also, uh, I do some work for the, with him, so that's good. Again, I'm doing an audio book of one of his other books, actually. Vocation. We talk about that all the time. Mm -hmm. A little short book. This is Michael Berg, who's at, mm -hmm. uh, he's a Wells guy. So, hmm. nice. We're, look at the, I, I don't know. I just keep getting more books from them. Lutheran Toolkit. Yeah. yeah. What's, this is like a, like a little catechism. Is that little Kenny Jones's book? Yep. Yep. Uh, defense of Christian ritual, which I'm excited yeah. to actually get into, because we talk a lot about liturgy. Mm -hmm. and I, I was kind of surprised, you know, 1517 is... Not um, the most liturgical? Not, yeah, I mean, not intentionally liturgical. It's not part of their, like, ethos. It's like, here's who we are, we're litur you know, gonna right. classic liturgy, but yep. they've got a book defending that. Our friend Broer, you know, Faith Alone, mm -hmm. translation of Bo Geertz. Yep, always good. <laughs> the pile just keeps going here. Who am I? What about what do you think this is about? It's about vocation uh, again. Oh. <laughs> nope, it's about callings, vocations. Another vocation go. book. This is uh, from a professor at Irvine. So we got that. And then uh, you know Chad got Chad, of course. Of course. Three sixty five devotions. Always have Hebrew. to bring up Chad, don't we? I make I do a podcast version of this, so each one of these is. Available it is amazing that a story. man with so little talent as Chad has made it so far in life. <laughs> 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 uh, so the, is. this is this is our this these were the sponsor spots for today yes. okay so, so our go check them out go check out all the books at 1517 there's something and, for uh, everyone yeah there's probably and if more there is some subject that you would like somebody to address in book form from 1517 do that too 
There's, you know, yeah, I'm sure email. they've got somebody that'll write it. Yeah. I got another book coming out in a year. I'm hot on the trail of that. So, yeah, it's constant. It's nonstop. Best way I can describe the book I'm writing is, what if Friedrich Nietzsche were an archdemon <laughs> attempting to uh, apostatize a young pastor? I'll put it that way. What is... Uh... What does uh, Athens have to do with the Jerusalem. demonic, I guess? The demonic, <laughs> yeah, something like that. An apologetic book based on the screw tape letters. Yeah. In the in the vein of, right? Yeah, yeah in the vein of. But very mimicry the is, of. is the best form of flattery, right? Well, and this is, since we're on the topic, and we'll segue into Capon with this, but I think one of the things that the church has struggled with in the past five generations or so at least the Lutheran church. I wouldn't say the whole church because I think the evangelicals in the 60s, 70s, and 80s really took hold of addressing society in the present tense. Mm -hmm. And the Lutheran church has been remarkably slow to address culture until after the fact. Yeah. Current events. And not not always. It's not monolithically true, but... If we didn't want to be the 700 club, I think, yeah, on the I, one hand. Well, maybe a part of it is just a response to or reaction to evangelical Christianity. We don't want to get lumped in with them. So I know when I wrote that book, um, there were criticisms from more conservative people that it sound you sound like an evangelical. And I'm like, what do you mean I sound like an evangelical? They're like, well, you're always talking, you started talking about your life. I'm like, oh, you mean I shared my testimony? Like mm -hmm. in an evangelical sense. And I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. I'm like, yep. or I was just trying to make the book relatable because I was dealing with really heavy doctrinal subjects like the bondage of the will. And it's a lot easier for people to get traction if you just yeah. put it in relatable terms. And maybe you're not, not everything you're not evangelicals it lighter. do is bad. <laughs> you're not, I mean, it's not being lighthearted about it. It's, no. It's... Well, it's also not virtue signal. It's not like, hey, look at my spiritual experience and how awesome God is. It's well, like, no. I mean, that was, that's always the accusation, though. Well, it is, but it's, it's obtuse because, well, one, again, two-thirds of the Bible's narrative theology. And mm -hmm. two, you're dealing with something that 500 years later we're still grappling with like the bondage of the will or the third article of the creed and the catechisms and, so and to how try to you... try to understand yeah. that from an abstract perspective of just dogma right. is right. going to be next to impossible probably it would be as entertaining and interesting and i think educational as if we read capon and then you immediately turned to mueller's dogmatics and started to quote from mueller's dogmatics oh as as a response yeah yeah rather than Boring. as a pastor this is how what capon's saying translates into everyday parish life or as a, or as a father or you know, or whatever it coffee might be, roaster yeah i think it's yeah. it's you you see this in politics and even in philosophy and theology obviously which is well these people that i disagree with do this so therefore we can't take anything good from what they're doing like nothing that they're doing is good then hmm. versus okay. well just because you disagree with a group of people or you disagree with a genre like a literary genre it doesn't mean that there's nothing about it that is good or helpful or useful to you right right and you can learn something useful from everybody. I mean, the Nazis were masters of propaganda. Obviously, governments since then have learned a great deal from Himmler and Goering about how to engage populations with propaganda. They didn't just like, well, the Nazis were evil, so we're just going to forget everything they did. Well, it's like like we were talking about over the weekend. I, I was digging into, um, who, was the, who was the guy that was talking about propaganda? I sent you a link. Um who's now, I guess, kind of aligned with liberals, but he was an anarchist, historically. Really? Who did I, who did I send you? Who did, you said you were really into him in, in, in college. Oh, you mean Chomsky. Chomsky, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, but Noam Chomsky's... Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky's, like, his critique, um, especially the way that he understood, like, um, you know, the Nixon um, impeachment yeah. stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and what happened there. I mean, I, I think he has kind of... Uh, well, certainly counter narrative, if anything, right, right. So he's he's helpful now. I mean, his politics aren't, but his no. critique maybe of the use of media, I think, mm -hmm. is you know, and it complements. Yeah, actually, to me, it really complemented uh, like Neil Postman and mm -hmm. you know uh, McLuhan and the, you know the other media critics mm -hmm. quite well. It's another perspective. Uh, he he's almost positive about it. It's like, well, we can't avoid it, so we might as well use it. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of his approach. It's like media is always manipulative. That's what it right. does. Yeah. I'm like, oh. And they got me thinking about Luther, right? And Luther being kind of the Donald Trump of his day, you yeah. know, kind of a, a wild boar and hard to control. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, his tweets go, go viral, in effect, mm -hmm. you know, because of the absurd things that he would say. Right. 
or at least perceived absurdity. Yeah. Right. You know, and it was like, oh, so then I should get, the, we should get the book. Maybe we should even read it on the show. I should at least get it. Um, Brand Luther, right? Which mm-hmm. talks about how Luther, you know, could be understood according to modern um, right. marketing techniques, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. <laughs> whether whether you stumbled on it, you know, uh, inadvertently or not. Well, I think it's just recognizing, like you said, that in his case, it would be pamphlets, pamphleteering, and... Well, it was out of control too. He didn't control it. He didn't even put his name on this stuff. People right. Well, there's no copyright laws to protect him either. So (laughs) people just you know grasped upon it and used it. And yeah, you see that in every generation, and you you recognize the use of popular media, Mm -hmm. and you recognize how it can be leveraged (laughs) to to support your cause or whatever it might be. You see that I was just talking to you about that before we hit record that. You see people now with social media recognizing this is a tool to awaken people, but originally mm-hmm. it was intended to brainwash people and right. indoctrinate people and engage in social engineering and social control of mass populations of people. But now it's gotten so out of control, the only way to stop the awakening that's happening is by shutting it off altogether. Well, actually, people have figured out how to use it, um, you know, to... Right. Yeah, exploit it, use it to convince, and um, correct. You know, like like I've I've been experimenting with just this mimetic approach on Facebook, mm-hmm. which isn't how fa- I'm basically using Facebook like Twitter, right? Uh, which is interesting because it because nobody else is doing this, at least you know of my group of quote unquote friends. Mm-hmm. I don't have any friends, so I don't I don't know what that means, but whatever. <laughs> uh, that's a joke. Maybe I have one friend. Thanks for I'm here doing the show with me. I'm here for you. Buddy. Uh, <laughs> anyway, just you know. Just brief, you know, fortune cookie kind of things, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's interesting because people actually find them quite, you know, evocative and powerful, and right. like it's kind of obvious stuff usually. Yeah. And, and or or as Ann says, I don't know if I don't usually know what you're talking about. I'm like, well, that's fine mm-hmm. too, right? right? But but it is, you know, that, that transformation of social media for for, you know, it's a tool mm-hmm. ultimately. Right. It's 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 not morally evil or good. It may have had immoral intent originally. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, but it can be used for good. You know, like any other tool, like a brick, right? right. You can throw it through the window, or right. you can use it to build something, right? So, so why did it. we bring? Why did I bring up the the media? Oh, we we're talking about using somebody who you don't agree with, but actually you can be you can be critical of, but also recognize that right. there there's some wisdom there, right? And like I said, you know, it's it's a mark of maturity and a mark of true friendship that you can love someone and yet still hold them accountable. Mm, right. You can have fun and joke around and forgive their their idiosyncrasies the same as they forgive yours but simultaneously say that's too far like i'm not going to allow that right we were talking about this before we went on air in regards to preaching i mean we don't yeah. we, we rely upon our congregation to be that check um <laughs> but they don't but they yeah right um well they're probably just scared of you mostly um, mostly yeah <laughs> but imagine i mean i've often lamented that that we don't have like brotherhood in mm-hmm. the parish right yeah we so don't. like no. like yeah. where's the retired pastor you know that that's like, hey, can I, you know, let's talk about your sermon on Sunday and let's, kind yeah. of, you know, help you work, work through it or, right. you know, let's look forward and, right. you know, because otherwise, well, I mean, because we're, we always try to push the envelope of what, mm-hmm. what is uh, acceptable speech ultimately, you know, to yeah. try to keep people, keep people on their toes and, and thinking critically and right. not, not just default kind of the old grooves that mm-hmm. the old preach rust, abstract yes, generalities, preach yeah. up on ideas. Yeah, exactly. Stay Which, away from uh, anything that's provocative or controversial. Right. And sometimes, well, like I told you yesterday, um, and I think it works for me, it's like, you know, I might go too far and I might mm-hmm. be wrong, you know, and if I'm mm-hmm. wrong, thanks be to God. Because yeah. usually we're talking about, you know, stuff with regards to the law and immorality and uh, right. injustice and whatnot. If I'm wrong, that's great. I'm glad yeah. it'll be a better world. If right. I'm right, you know, we, I'm, now you're, you're prepared to address it because you actually, you had to think about it now. Right. You know, is that a, is that a real, you know, is that a real threat to your faith? Mm-hmm. You know, the thing that pastor said was a threat, right. which you thought was just politics or just uh, medical science or whatever. Right. But I you think know. that's the appeal of Capon is that he does mm-hmm. address something that's very specific to the church. Yeah. And yet what he's trying to point out is that it's not exclusive to the church. Mm. And as a consequence, the church essentially silos itself cuts itself off from the world, takes the doors off the church, puts up some drywall, and then the only way you get into the church is through like a window or something like that. Because it, it 
the church is preaching a certain kind of grace or a certain kind of forgiveness or a certain gospel, but not the fullness of it. It's not giving it giving the word of God its due. I think it's even and more than that. It's it's preaching a life that isn't a life that people actually correct. experience, right? Or that they know, right? It's it's like I've said is that in the past year we see the church is is supposed to be it must be a place where life is not only proclaimed but actually bequeathed, given, enjoyed, yeah, and and then and then in freedom enjoyed. And I preached on this yesterday. I sent you the sermon, and it's interesting to see the response of, again, some people crying and smiling and other people staring straight ahead without blinking and move, or moving because they're offended at the fact that I brought up masks <laughs> and distancing and so forth and they're sitting there wearing a mask. But yet simultaneously their attitude is, well, that's your opinion. And then the other people are saying, you gave me, like you set me free. You use the word of God to set me free so that yeah. I can go back into my vocations and not live in fear or anxiety or insecurity or apprehension or shame about what I've chosen to do in the name of loving my neighbor. Right. And I think where you and I would critique Capen, but you have to, again, you have to be careful of the fact that Capen is not dealing with what we're dealing with now. So when you read him, you have to qualify that, is that he is more interpersonal in his address. That's why he creates these these characters like we talked about in the last episode. He creates characters that have the conversation with and it's very specific to this person versus I think what you and I are addressing is a, a, a widespread evil or a mass malevolence that's happening. And so in a way, the reason that Capen's helpful to me is he's addressing something that this isn't just for the church, this is for the world. Yeah, and I think so. And likewise, then what we're doing is addressing evil or malevolence in such a way that we're saying this is not a church problem. This is a world problem that's come into the church by way of its members. Mm -hmm. And our responsibility as pastors is to call it out because it actually gets in the way of Christ, which means it yeah, gets that's... in the way of life. <laughs> That, that was the point I was going to make, too, is to say, I mean, there are material, physical, emotional, you know, consequences yeah. of, of, of this malevolent evil that we're unmasking. Mm -hmm. I ran with the same themes, you know, of social isolation, because I had had that conversation yeah. with our, uh, with psychologists, you know, just like, why, why didn't the psychologist have a place at the table to say, yeah. these measures that you're putting in place, social distancing and isolating people at home and, and then mm -hmm. actually covering their faces and whatnot, you knew the psychological effect this would have on, on especially right. on children, but but all people, and mm -hmm. yet wh where were you? And they're like, well, mm -hmm. we weren't allowed to talk. We weren't right. able to be at the table. They didn't want to hear what we had to say. Right. Like, huh? No, my well, pushback that, against that would be they didn't allow you to talk. So why didn't you just go to a different platform and talk? Well, it's why the same you thing. You don't. Up? It's fear. You don't want to be canceled. You don't want to right. be you know excluded. Right. You want to. You don't want to be the people who are like, hey, wait a minute, you know, and and but to. I mean, I ran with the same themes. We had a bunch of visitors because we had a baptism. And the mm. visitors are like, thank you for saying what I've been thinking this whole time. And I'm like, right. and, and I know the members are like, yeah, pastor's already been talking about this, right? So we're kind of, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, we get it already. Johnny up there. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, it does probably seem that way. Um, but on the other hand, yeah, it was it was really encouraging to hear, you know, they're like, you know, we've, we've wondered about it the whole time and we just can't, we, we can't understand it. It was like what I told you from uh, Jordan Peterson in his yeah. most recent um most recent interview with the the guy from uh, Grace School, you know, who called out their woke culture stuff. Yeah. Um, towards the end, you have to get it's a lot of conversation, but once you get towards the end, uh, it, you know, Peterson's like, I I can't understand why this woke ideology is so captivating to people. Mm -hmm. Right. It doesn't make sense. It's not rational. I, he doesn't have any framework to understand it. And you're like, ah, oh, yes. But but actually, you know there is one, which mm -hmm. is that it is it's it's you know the god of chaos, right? Yeah. Um, or rather, the demon, the the angel of light. Right. It's a spirit so. of oppression. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. I mean, this is we're talking about demonic captivity here on a on a wide scale. Which goes People, to the point, though, that that means that the church, by and large, is asleep. Or themselves possessed. Or themselves are possessed. Oh, geez, that's even worse. Actually, it is. Is that they themselves are possessed by the same, which I guess is provable by the fact that I kept preaching about the cult and what right, defines a cult and, and the followers of the cult. And then you look around and you're like, oh, I think you just described this person that's sitting right next to me. Right. But like, I was just thinking well, like the churches that are closed in my area are, are almost entirely, not entirely, but almost entirely places that have already forsaken the gospel. Correct. 
So it's not surprising that they would be held then by this new spirit of captivity because they because they are a spiritual or you know contra yeah. Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah. So so whatever spirit comes along is going to hold them captive because they had already forsake you know, forsaken Christ for that. It just came by a different name before. Yeah. That's and so now we just we see it we see it for what it is. Yeah, we see it for what it is. But the fact that the church, and by the church, I mean churches, mm -hmm. either don't or refuse to recognize the power of the demonic at play in the fact that there's churches that have closed and are never going to open again, churches that are remaining shut down in many states because the governor says so, or the mayor says so, mm -hmm. and so many Christians who just refuse to go back to church because of fear and, yeah. and yeah. shame. And then you get up and preach and point out these, you point this out, and the response is either, like you said, either thank you for saying what I've been thinking and giving voice to it and setting me free to speak my mind, or, right. well, that's just your opinion. And I don't really think you should talk about that because it makes people uncomfortable. Or you're hurting well, people's feelings versus, because again, I can say, I can say in my context, there's people that used to be diehard church members before last March who, when they've come back, left and went you know i don't i don't come to church to hear about this stuff yeah i come to hear to church to hear about and then they tell me what they want me to talk well, about it's what fair, they want to hear it's fair it's fair enough it might be opinion mm -hmm. um and and that will be proven out by facts right ultimately by right. evidence right so and so maybe maybe in six months or a year or 10 years or whatever it is you know we'll look back and say yeah we kind of were captivated by the moment and you know we were offbeat i mean at this point i, I can't honestly say that's true no based off of what i've seen i don't i tend to preach historically meaning i just look at history so yeah I you look at the patterns history. of history politicians yeah. don't care about us they're not coming to save us they don't care about helping us that's a historically accurate statement i'm not making a statement that isn't provable from history for example Maybe yeah. with maybe with just some rare exceptions. Exactly. Or you know, saying that the church is always exceptions. afflicted, and when the church is not afflicted by the state, Christians ought to worry. That's a historically proven fact. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that churches that survive in, let's say, a totalitarian regime, by right. and large, are churches that have been given talking points, and they stick to those. Versus they the true church. They cooperate to graduate, as we used to say, cooperate right? Cooperate to graduate, exactly. Get along, go along. <laughs> Um, and yeah, to call that out when it's institutionalized, when it is the actual status quo of the churches, that is like Nietzsche says, that is one of those uncomfortable truths that most people refuse to even entertain. Yeah. Because I suppose it's prophetic voice or, you know, we're, we're acting yeah, as course. seers, but, right. but the see, but our seeing is not, is not, um, uh, like imaginary. But it's actually applying, like you said, experience. Right. You know, the the narrative history of the scripture would be that alone would give us enough. Like right. just read like the history of Saul, for example, the king, yeah. King Saul. Right. And like, right. huh, wait a minute, a king corrupted by power. I can't imagine right. that would ever happen. Oh, it sounds like right. Nixon roaming the White House going mad. Yeah. yeah. Right. He became the mad king. It's like right. how many examples from history do we need of, of a mad you know right. mad king? <laughs> right. Why are you surprised? Yeah. So I'm a big proponent. And I'm praying for God to restore the era of the judges. Ooh. Because I'm I'm super down with that. And that's kind of how I run pastoral ministry nowadays. <laughs> it's like, I like Melody's comment. Judges. I you know, asked Melody's my historian, right. yep. my historian pastor friend about this. I'm like, I mean, who actually um, studied in East Germany when it was East Germany. Wow. Um, and just said, you know, what, uh, what do you think about <laughs> all this? <laughs> like, have you seen this before? Because I haven't seen mm -hmm. you. He's not posting things on social. I'm like, doesn't this seem somewhat similar to you? And like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of the the worst elements of of, yeah. <laughs> of East Germany, of Italy, of Russia, all kind mm -hmm. of in China now, all kind of merged together, right. you know, in in a really well. I mean, they just ultimately you've got uh, evil men learning from their mistakes, right? Yeah. So we're going to talk about something more optimistic. I don't know. Capen Are probably we? is. We're going to talk about guilt. <laughs> 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 we're such dour people we really are. Uh, well we're up in midwestern lutherans so. <laughs> it's, it's the water it's in the water in. yeah <laughs> that no that's not the fluoride no that that's just <laughs> that's just that's just plain old water <laughs> we're gonna go to back to the mystery of christ and why we don't get it the mystery of guilt we we kind of did the setup last episode mm -hmm. 
Did we do two or do we keep it? I split it. Yep. You split. Okay. So episodes. So today then we're going to jump ahead a little ways into fear because I don't want to deal with adultery right now because I completely disagree with Capen's take on adultery because I think he basically runs away from it because he committed adultery and he just spent three pages justifying his adultery. Yeah. Well, that is the blind spot, isn't it? Yeah, I kind of think so. So we're skipping right. that part, but you're free to read it. He talks about Helen and adultery and... Like I said, uh, I disagree with his handling of the con- of the conversation, the topic of adultery, because there's no call to repentance in anything he talks about. No, no, no. And that to me is a big sticking point. Is uh, like I've and I've had to deal with this several times as a pastor. Is that when someone comes to me, confesses their sin regarding adultery, they're obviously ripped apart by it, they're torn apart by it. I absolve them in the name of Christ, and then I ask them, okay, now what are you going to do? with the freedom that Jesus has just given you right. to deal with your vocation, which is the fact that your marriage is now gone. You wrote, and there may be children you, uh, involved. and yeah. You tore apart your marriage contract. You're not married anymore. You're in breach of contract. So yeah, Jesus forgives you. Welcome back. However, your spouse hasn't. Maybe your children. Maybe, your whole, mm-hmm. you know, maybe it affects the whole family. And so there is repentance in the way of Christ in the gospel there. That is that the absolution, the forgiveness of sins sets you free to take full responsibility right. for what you've done. In fact, I've done this in prison ministry and I've had people in jail for decades accept that, okay, I committed this crime. I did it. But now that I've confessed and been absolved, I can do the time. Like I can do the time because you know what? I committed the crime and I deserve to be punished. And in freedom, you can do that. Whereas before, they couldn't do that. They're running away from it. Yeah, well, but you can't f- run away with it from it when you're in jail, I suppose. Okay. Oh, no. Or in prison. Everybody in jail is innocent. Everybody's been falsely convicted. Everybody's a victim. Oh, innocent. right. That rhetoric, yeah. Yeah. But and it's actually the guilty one. You're right. Right. And then huh. you're like, let's... And really what you're setting them free to do is simply accept reality, to your point. Well, and then to make something of it, right? Right. Because those are the folks that will start the prison ministry or whatever. Correct. And start getting their GED or getting a college degree or learning a vocation. And and then all of a sudden, again, what the the gospel does is it opens up the future. I mean, at least you have free room and board, right? Right. But rather than say, well, I've got to be here another 10 years. And by the time I get off, I'm going to be 56 and I'm going to be unemployable. And my my kids are estranged from me and my life is over. Instead, they say, I'm getting out of here when I'm 56. I've got a lot of time left with my family to like rebuild our relationships. I can get a job. I can get my own house. I can have a garden. The forgiveness of sin opens up that future to you because mm-hmm. now you're seeing the future in relation to eternity. You're seeing the, re- the future in relation to Christ and just the giftedness of life. Yeah. If you don't have that, if you're not hearing that gospel preached, I seriously question what gospel you're actually hearing then. Mm. Well, that was that's the approach to adultery, at least in my experience, of yeah. you know the more liberal amongst you know Christian churches is mm. they just they just kind of give it a pass, yeah, because it's just how people are these days or mm-hmm. whatever, you know. And and you look at it and you're like you're actually leaving people in captivity and bondage, right. and you know, and and they're going to make a mess of of what they have left of everything, Correct. and yeah. never mind the effect it'll have upon the rest of their family and the children and whatnot. Right. No. And, are, and there was the church that could have. Sp- the church could have spoken and been like mm-hmm. the person that said, "No, we're going to." This was a question we had in Sunday or in Bible study yesterday. Mm-hmm. It's like, "Well, why do we have so much cohabitation?" And I said, "It's because parents don't tell them to cut it out." And like, mm-hmm. they leave it to the pastor to come in, the pastor whom nobody trusts well, anybody. Usually anyway, the, pa- the, kid, the parents did it too. It just well, maybe right. And you're like, it's just not the best way, right? right. I'm not saying it can't be, you know, the, it can't be forgiven and the marriage can can go yeah. forward and whatever. Of course it does. But on the other hand, you're like. But why would you encourage it, right? I mean, that's right. the problem. You encourage it by saying nothing, right? Effectively, and I was like, just put your just put your foot down and say, look, hey, let's figure out a way to make this work, mm-hmm. right? Well, you know, I'll put you up. Well, pay for an apartment or whatever for you, mm-hmm. so you've got a place to stay until, mm-hmm. or, or you can, like you've talked about, you know, just well, actually, I know this from another pastor where you just put up somebody in, in their basement, right? Yeah. So you can live with us until it's time. Yeah. You know, until the ceremony, whatever. Great opportunity right. for mentorship. It was actually. Yeah. It turned out quite well for that individual. So, speaking of fear, <laughs> yes. <coughs> so on hard, page twenty, hard turn hard, there, hard turn. <laughs> so on page twenty-two of the Mystery of Christ and Why We Don't Get It by Robert Ferrar Capen. Speaking of fear, 
I want to go back for a moment to the word daddy. I introduced a few paragraphs earlier. In spite of the fact that people have an inveterate hankering to put the church in loco parentis, that oh, is, in place of parents. I hate that. It drives me which crazy. Which is what you were just referring to, which is why I said, speaking of here. Uh-huh. And in spite of the fact that the church more often than not has gleefully thrown itself into the role of being everybody's mommy and daddy, the whole exercise is a terrible idea. Mm-hmm. I would actually argue that people throw me into the role of spiritual daddy. Correct. More than I ever wanted it. It's like, can you be me? Can you just stand in my place and, and act on my behalf for me and speak for me? And to Capen's I, point, I mean, I think we have to emphasize this, right? That yeah. by by asking the pastor to do what is given to the father or given to the to the mother well, or whatever, mm-hmm. um, is inferior. Correct. Actually, I think I posted that on Facebook last week. Yeah, no, it's inferior. You're like, oh, mm-hmm. you hate to say, pastor's inferior to a father. Yeah, he actually is. Sorry, when it comes to teaching well, the faith, actually, we'll end up making him an inferior father to his own children. Oh, the the father who neglects that responsibility. And gives yeah. it to the par- the pastor. Yeah, because yeah. now all of a sudden I'm not just responsible for my own children, but your children too. Right, and I know it, we're sounding a little patriarchal here, but that's because the scriptures are. Because we right. are. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, there's that. Are I supposed to apologize for being a man? <laughs> um, Wrong guy. Today? Sorry, yeah, dude. I guess so. Yeah, oh, today? Well. No, ain't gonna happen. Hmm. So this insidious parental image of the church does not conform to what even a halfway decent parent actually does. Well, there you go. Yep. Only rotten fathers and mothers ride roughshod over their children's freedom to make mistakes. Only the worst parents ever suggest that there are unforgivable acts that will, unless avoided by the children, be the death of parental love. Ooh, don't do that or I'm going to kill you. Right. Hmm. Only the most dreadful grown-ups use fear to control the young. Man. Sorry, there's a healthy there, fear. There's I was a healthy say, fear. There is malevolent evil in the world. Uh-huh. <laughs> let's not let's not go overboard. Yeah, I mean well, that's how we approach the internet. I mean we put a pretty tight tight control yeah. on that. Yeah. That there are a good number of such disreputable types, and all and that all of us to some degree are equally disreputable, should not blind us to the fact that the concept of God as an angry, unforgiving parent, and of His Church as a domineering grown up issues threats to willful kids, is bad news, not gospel. Uh Such concepts inculcate only fear, fear of God, and then fear of our own freedom. They lead not to liberty of the children of God, to the freedom with which Christ has set us free, but to a servile mentality that kills courage and breathes resentment. There you go. I was going to suggest this. I mean, I... I, uh, There's this fear of failure, right? And Mm -hmm. we've called it like you know, in regards to parenting, like the nerfing of the world, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. There's the the height book where he talks about um, kids are anti-fragile, but we don't believe yeah. that, right. you know, that they're, they're actually, they, they, they learn a sense of danger, right? And mm-hmm. sometimes, you know, the hard way, right? Mm-hmm. But that's how we learn. And if right. you don't allow the child, I mean, if everything is, you know, don't touch, don't taste, don't feel, mm-hmm. don't, you know, then at some point they either it's become forbidden fruit, right? And mm-hmm. then they want to do it all. Correct. Right, the way that, that Paul talks about coveting, right? And mm-hmm. as soon as they tell you what coveting is, you want to do it. Um, and you could apply that to pretty much any sin, I suppose. Uh, but Or you have the other thing where they just live this life captivated in right. fear, and, mm-hmm. they're, and they can't, they're, they're just, what do you want to say, paralyzed. Right. And I how many the, congregations are this yeah. way, right? Are just oh, completely absolutely. paralyzed by a fear of like, well, if we try this, if we spend some money on this, or a lot of money on this, it's yeah. going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be a complete waste of time, or what if it mm-hmm. is? What will happen? God will be angry with us. And like, really? That's not how he talks about money in the Bible, right? Right. You know, right. use it. it yeah. It's like, even if it ends up being a, a quote unquote waste, mm-hmm. who cares? It's just money. He'll give you right. more. Right. It's not real. <laughs> it's not money even is real not in the real. first place. It's, it's, it's. Fiat <laughs> currency is not real money. <laughs> just yeah. Federal Reserve Bank, guys. Go look it up. Well, and you know, you add that to the mommy and daddy state. Uh-huh. That, the, that the government has already taken, at least in Minnesota and, well, the United States in general. I would say, And yeah. then you, you're just propounding the problem because your children, at least my children, look at the current state of the state and the current state of the society, and that's what they're seeing is, why is the government interfering in our house? Why is the government mm-hmm. telling us what we can and can't do in our backyard? Why is or, the government telling... Yeah. 
why are they why are they plugging in that fiat currency in, right. with in large amounts yeah um and without without any kind of like need it's not need based right, right. what well, are they I, setting you up for exactly right mm -hmm. is that and you have we, we both have uh, sons that are roughly the same age and at least my son at this point is like ah, i'm not leaving the house for the near future because i have no idea what is i'm definitely not going to college and I'm definitely not going to live on campus yeah. because I don't like their politics. I don't like their ideology. I don't like all the mandates, the COVID mandates and all the things that you have to do to just go to college. He's like, I'm not going to live in fear and anxiety for the rest of my life. And I'm like, you're living in fear and anxiety right now because you're afraid to set foot on a college yeah, campus. Yeah, pick your fear ultimately, right? right? Ultimately, mm -hmm. it is exactly that. And so there's already plenty of fear to go around. There's already plenty of this parental bullying going mm -hmm. around because of the state. And right. the fact that, as we've talked about the last year, the ultimate purpose of what the state is doing currently is to make us all children of the state. Servile. And raise yeah. children to be children of the state because that's communism. I mean, that's that's straight up what you do in a socialist communist state. Well, it's supplant the family, the become the family, right? right? Supplant the right. church, be the church. Exactly. Um, and ultimately, I mean, it's not even really a parent-child relationship because it's not all that benevolent. It's an abusive parent-child relationship. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And just constant gaslighting. <laughs> <sighs> That's why I like to... I, For a long time, for a couple of months, I couldn't use Apple News or Google News mm -hmm. or any of those news aggregators, the popular one. But now I read Apple News and I just assume everything I'm reading is backwards, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, upside so down world. Speak. Yeah, and so when you read it, you're like, oh, this is really, it's really fascinating. The one today, this was in the Atlantic, so, you know, a mm -hmm. bastion of uh, conservative press. Um, it's called, millions are saying no to the vaccines. What are they thinking, question mark? And so I had to click on it, right? I had to click mm -hmm. on it. And you go and read, and the person did due diligence, actually interviewed a bunch of people. Um, they're not all, you know, Republican or something interviewed mm -hmm. all these people and then at the end is like well, okay here's here's some three suggestions how we might convince these people right and mm -hmm. and you look at it you're like we need something like doordash for vaccines like seriously yeah <laughs> two make mm -hmm. it suck more not to be vaccinated well okay if you're in a nanny state with with parents running the show that's exactly what you do right yeah make your life miserable and then and then then to teach people that their natural immunity isn't enough to protect grandmother all right and you just look at it and like, oh, I see what you're doing here. Yeah. You gave due diligence. You you allowed the you allowed the anti vaxxer you know, most of which they acknowledged weren't actually like total anti vaxxers just anti COVID vaccine. Right. We go because you know emergency use, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But in the end, it's like, oh, you just want us to feel comfortable with the idea of just subjecting ourselves to whatever the state says mm -hmm. is good for us, whether it's right. the medical state or it's the it's for the greater good political state. Yeah, and in the greater good. Yeah, we both yeah. used that yesterday. The claw. What a... <laughs> just reminds me of Toy Story in the the pit with the aliens. <laughs> the oh, claw, the only chosen to get, one to get chosen. <laughs> yes, only yeah. to get chosen. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, to his point, then, this does not lead to the liberty of the children of God, mm -mm. to the freedom with which Christ has set us free, but to servile mentality that kills courage and breeds resentment, which I would argue is the current state of the churches. Who do they resent? Resent the church, resent God. That's what he's talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, because they by forsaking the freedom that he actually gives... Then right. who does God become? He becomes this angry, judgmental right. guy who put who's putting you through this COVID terrible you know, right. life. Which is like I brought up that point, and I'm not actually joking. Is that if God could return us to an era of judge of the judges, mm -hmm. the best thing about the judges is that they're good, and they're not safe at all. Like they're good <laughs> men, and they're terrible, but they're not safe. quote unquote good. I mean, I'm thinking of Samson comes to mind right away. I, that's why I said that. I, that's why I said that on purpose. I, that. I know that. He's um, kind of. <laughs> he's a saint. He does God's work. He does he's, God's he's work. He's in Hebrews 11. He counts. Uh, oh, he is. He is in that. He's in the yeah. book of faith as an example of faith. That's why I said he's good. It's not so, so much we, what happened during his life; it's how he ended his life, I suppose. But he was a whoremonger. It says mm. that in the text that he was a whore monger. Like, he loved those Philistine women, yeah. Yeah, not not on occasion did he do this. Like His the one he married and then the fact he, they're like, he, do you have to really? You can't just date a nice Jewish girl. It's always got to be a prostitute. Well, always? and he put it, he put her away like after the marriage, like two days later. Yeah, it's just like yeah. he just left her behind. It's like, yeah. what kind of terrible guy are you? It's like, <laughs> and yet he's called he's good. 
<laughs> He's good. <laughs> I, we, have oh, to re- we have to readjust. We have to readjust and recognize that, again, the saints of God don't appear all that saintly. And second mm-hmm. of all, that the judges were sent by God, just like the Holy Spirit is pronounced in John, to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's what the judges do. They show up and they're like, there's the sin, there's the righteousness, here's the judgment. Repent and believe the good news now, or I'm going to annihilate you. And P.S., that's what God wants. Uh, and yeah. the problem that we have when we've talked about this off air is God lays out very specifically, this is how this is going to go down. Mm-hmm. And this is where Capon, again, we, we might get to it today, but this is where I think he gets it totally wrong is, God promises to annihilate all of those who stand in the way of his promise. Right. That's the right kind of fear it. of God, right. isn't it? Right. It's yeah. like we joked about at Christmas time when people were like, well, you know, the Christians, they just took the, the festival of Mithras or whatever. And, and I'm like, yeah, that's what our God does. Uh huh. That's kind of what he does. He kills false gods and then takes captive their holidays for himself. He <laughs> essentially it's kind of fun. Kicks, it's almost like if there's a guy who like lived in a big house and he was like really rich and powerful. And Jesus like goes into that guy's house and kicks him out and then just lives in that house and then lets us live with them, him in the house. Yeah. It's kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's this, it's this abandoned <laughs> mansion that, you know, because yeah. he ran them all off and here you go, but have a this place. Idea that, yeah. But it's that whole idea of, well, God is this sweet, nice, lovable. He's a big hugger. He's kind of like Santa Claus versus like, no, he's more like Samson than he's like Santa Claus. I would say not, and not not at scary Santa Claus. You're talking about like, see, because I, I don't really go like lucky Santa Claus. jolly Saint, Con- Saint Nick. Oh, okay, like the one you know, in Holly uh, Jolly Christmas Saint Nick, Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street. Yes, not bad Santa, not bad Santa. Really Bob Thornton. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Good. Not with a well, scary mask either. Because we have no. such a again, we we read scripture and go, well, I don't like what God says here, and I don't like what God does over there. So let's just ignore that. Let's excerpt mm-hmm. that. But I like this over here. <laughs> So let's hold on to this. And like I brought up before is that there's the two most used analogies in all of scripture to describe God is shepherd and warrior. Yeah. Like those are his two most used analogies for himself. And actually he uses the term warrior more than he uses the term shepherd in the Old Testament. And the angel, and the angel of the Lord is, is at the front of the charge yeah. into, the, into the conquest of Canaan. I mean, he's yeah. the one slaying the enemies and you're like, right. And really? that's all there. And yet we ignore it just like the imprecatory Psalms. Well, and if, we and if it's the angel of the Lord, I mean, this is this is you know, Jesus mm-hmm. um, destroying our enemies, right? Like, and they just happen to be other people in that part of the story, right? And like, ooh, that's uncomfortable, like, right? Yeah, it is. That narrative does not fit within what he's laying out here about the church being mommy and daddy, mm. unless your parents are homicidal maniacs. Yeah. Which is right. a whole other conversation. Well, maybe maybe this is it. I mean, there's different vocations, and within those vocations, there's different authority, right? Correct. So, so I mean, parents have a particular authority, but it isn't to be God. No. Maybe uh, in some in some respects, it's to be God in God's place, right? It's you might to want to speak say God's that word for the people in the back that didn't hear you. <laughs> what? Oh, not only did I not are we not to now? be God, we're not supposed to imitate Him because we're not. God. Uh, I don't know about that. What about the image of God stuff? That's the image of God that He creates, right? It yeah, well, the t- are doing. well, Paul Paul gets it straight, right? He says, yeah. you know, parents to emulate Christ in the church, right? Is yeah. to be the is to be a benevolent um, care, right. caregiver, to sacrifice. Yeah, to make sacrifice, right? Mm-hmm. Which is quite different than, um, you know, to give and to. Well, think about that. You know, God uh, gives life and He takes life. Correct. Like, Wait a minute, He can do that? Yeah. Well, He's mm-hmm. God, but you're yeah. not. <laughs> yes. Right. Right. So you don't get to go around willy-nilly and getting to choose who gets to live and who gets to die. That's exactly. not your job. Yeah. No, you don't have that authority. So still, much of the church, clergy, and laity alike go blithely on perpetuating its parental image. And then we have the nerve to wonder why so many people hate themselves for being sheep and hate the church for making them such. Exactly. This is appropriate. Okay. It is totally appropriate because it's something that I hammer on all the time, which is that, you know... There's two things that God loves. One of them is that you're bold as lions. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and we and we pray for the you know for the like you like we said was it before we went on air talking or no was it during the show when we talked about Sparta? You know, 
but you know, I want you know, I don't mind having people that push back and that ask hard mm -hmm. questions and that yeah. um, you know, are challenging and that challenge one another, right? Yeah. I mean, let's and like Bible study is meant to like, you know, is to check each other as we're reading right. the scripture and see are we on the yeah. same page? Are we moving in the same right. direction, you know? Right. And and to have that push and pull um right. is it for me it's a joyful thing. I love it as a teacher. Yeah. Um that's why I like teaching children because they don't care. They right. they don't make any pretense like, oh, I have to respect you, Pastor. That right. means I'm not going to ask yeah. any hard questions. Yep. You know. Um, and but we certainly don't do it in regards to you know a lot of the other practical matters of the church. Right. It's like there's no there's no push, there's no pull. Right. There's it's just we'll do what you say because you know your daddy, I guess. Well, and how in relation to the world when you're surrounded by a society of wolves, mm -hmm. is preaching about people being sheep comforting it's not because mm -hmm. you haven't preached the most important part of that which is the shepherd that fights on your behalf to right. protect you from the wolves but you yeah, then it's always about it's always about, about the, the rod it's always about the rod and the staff right Correct. but what does he use the rod and the staff for i guess we say right. you know he <clears> uses <throat> the rod you know the beater beater end of it you mm -hmm. know to beat us and it's like mm, is it true no no, that's to beat off the wolves. I mean, I suppose you could say law and gospel, maybe, but... You can. Yeah. But, but in but practical he, no. use, no, it's a defensive weapon. <laughs> right. Yeah, You're the crook, he pulls you back. Shoot. I get that, yep. right? Yep. But the, the beater end, yeah, he's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is a weapon. He's swinging it. Yeah. So you can't, I, in my opinion anyways, you can't preach on the sheep without preaching the shepherd, but then you, cannot, you can't preach the shepherd or the sheep without preaching about the wolves. I, yeah, well, Jesus doesn't. Right. He's like, how, you know, well, the shepherd protects us from the wolves. Well, okay, pastor, who are the wolves? Let's unmask them, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And mm -hmm. the church, in my experience, has run away from that as much as possible. We'll, well spend hours and hours and hours and thousands of words on sheep. Yeah. And then we'll just, the wolves, you know, the wolves. It's like, no, I don't know. Be specific. Yeah, well, and part of the challenge there, right, is uh, one, the wolves in sheep's clothing, right? That's mm -hmm. the first problem. So we do have yep. to unmask them. Yep. Um, the, sec the second problem is, I mean, we don't want people to be fearful. So we're worried and fearful of the wrong thing. So we're worried about exposing the wolves because then they're yeah. going to be afraid of the wolves. And you're like, well, yes, mm -hmm. except you're forgetting the gospel, right? I mean, right. you have a shepherd, protector shepherd, yeah. warrior shepherd who right. actually defends you against these wolves, right? But you see the wolves, you call them out. Right, mm -hmm. and you've also been equipped with those same weapons, right? The, yeah. the armament of the of the spirit. Right. So, like, what are you worried about? Well, right. ultimately, you're worried because you've forsaken actually yeah. the defender and the defense he gives. Yeah. Exactly. So, We've but, been but doing if you this don't, in, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. <clears throat> no, no. I was going to say in our Sunday morning Bible study, we're doing this series on fear, and mm -hmm. you know Proverbs. 29 i think it is that the fear of man is a is a snare it's a death trap but the fear of the lord is your safety Ooh, and good i like it what we've spent the most time on though because it's critical is both in greek and hebrew the different usage of words that are translated just monolithically as fear and so yara is the hebrew word for respect and honor in the way of fear of the lord respecting and honoring god is safety whereas i think it's hadad I think that's it, Chabad or Hadad, is, um, you know, it's what we would translate as phobia. Again, dread. It's, it's anxiety and trembling and dread. So when, you tr when you're in dread... It's harad. In, harad. Harad, yeah. Yep. The, the root of it, right? Harad. In, right. Because it's chay. Um, Cherdot. Yep. Yeah, harad, haradot. Um, C-H-A-R-D-O-T. And yeah. that's dread. And... So like we talked about previously, that's what the disciples experience in relation to Jesus, is dread. They're, they're Trembling, phobically... quaking, terror. Yes. 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 Whereas when you're in a right relation to God, you experience yara, respect, honor. No, no, you talk. You go first. You're Jesus. Go mm -hmm. ahead. You know? yeah. we, we'd say reverent. A... Yeah, reverence. It's the same thing. It's, it's mm -hmm. recognizing this person has done or said something for me or whatever that's worthy of my regard. Like I need to, this person is like, like John the Baptist says, I'm not worthy to tie his sandals. That's honor. That's respect. It's more and than that the, though. Well, yeah. Not to get you too derailed. When the relationship is out of whack, yeah. fear shifts from honor to dread. Mm -hmm. It shifts from 
respect and reverence to trembling and anxiety. And when the sheep are trembling, they're, they're suffering from overwhelming dread of the shepherd, not let alone the wolves. Right. <clears throat> the whole relationship's out of whack. And this yeah, is why we, then you read Genesis chapter 3, and Adam says, we hid because we were afraid. And it's the same word, it's charad, meaning Oof. we were terrified of you. We heard you coming, and because we were naked, we were terrified. I pointed out, when we look away from God and we look at each other, we experience phobos. The same guy that at... you were walking and talking with the day before. Exactly. It's the same now you, you, He hasn't changed. You, you've changed. Yep. <clears throat> and so simply by looking at each other and turning away from him, you go from respect and honor to dread and terror. And that's the Christian life in a nutshell is to live in that tension where when we turn our backs to the cross, there's dread, there's anxiety, there's terror. When we turn to face Jesus on the cross, there's respect, there's reverence, there's honor shown. Yeah. Because well, this is the Lamb of God, you know, crucified, for, executed for the sin of the world. Well, and that's what I was. That's where I was going to go with John the Baptist. I mean, it's beautiful because that's in the midst of his confession, right? That he's mm -hmm. the Lamb. That he says yeah. he's not worthy to untie the sandals. Which I, I don't know why I hadn't made the connection before, but it was recently that I recognized. Oh, this is the this is the kinsman redeemer story. This is the Boaz mm -hmm. and Ruth story, sure. right? And and John is saying, I'm not. I, I can't. I can't redeem mm -hmm. you. You have to redeem right. me. That's effectively right. what he's saying. Yeah. You're the Lamb. You're the Redeemer. Yeah. Um, and that's where that honor and respect and reverence comes from, that fear, is to say, let God right. be God, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> John's saying, yeah. said, you do your job. Mm -hmm. I've done, right. I'm just doing my job, right? Which leads, right. points people to you. And But well, I can't going be back you. back to your earlier point, you say something in the pulpit and it's proven to be wrong. Praise be to mm -hmm. God, because he just Absolutely. saved a whole bunch of people and yourself from a lot of damage. Versus someone comes and says, hey, you were wrong, and it turns out to be true, and now you're filled with dread because you were wrong. And now all of a sudden you're thinking about the next time you get in the pulpit, what if I'm wrong this time too? What if I'm wrong? Mm. What if I'm always, what if I've always been wrong? What if I've been wrong this whole time? What's God going to do? And then all of a sudden the dread takes over and now you're it, afraid of God. I think of it a little bit differently. I mean, part of the pastor's job <clears> is <throat> um, not, maybe not always to prepare for a, a particular eventuality, but for always for the potential, right? To say, right. here's the different ways that say um, that the attack can or might come. Yeah. Right and and to mm -hmm. say okay now now you can be on your guard against mm -hmm. you know these various ways that you know the devil and, and the demonic mm -hmm. and those who are in league you know will attack right. right and we know those from the scripture mm -hmm. right and and so in our particular context you know it may be um, that they try to um, you know invade into your family and into your right. family's life like we were talking about earlier right. right so we can warn people against that if it doesn't happen again mm -hmm. thanks be to God if it does happen Lord have mercy but right. also. He gives, right? He does right. give mercy. He gives us mercifully, gives us the tools we need, you know, to to mm -hmm. resist that attack. That but the temptation. The fact of the matter is, dread removes honor and respect, whereas honor and respect remove dread. Well, and so maybe that's the key: is to say, look, if you're going to point out a potential for an attack, mm -hmm. that then you know the preacher's job is to direct you to the way that Christ right. actually is the one who defends you against that attack. Right. So that mm -hmm. it's actually honor and reverence, and it's not just right. I'm dreading this this potential attack. Right. right. Okay. That's good. Exactly. So back to Cape, and then that's why the church needs perpetually to recover its grip on the gospel, the good news of grace and forgiveness, and to protest in every age against theological models that blow the gospel out of the water. Indeed, that is the reason I'm writing this book to protest against just such a model, a model I choose to call transactionalism. Exactly. Ooh. -hoo -hoo. We may have co-opted that. <laughs> we may have. And a witness to a better model based on the mystery of Christ. Because while it is indeed quite sufficient for all purposes, here or hereafter, to say you trust Jesus as your Savior, to affirm as the ultimate concern in your life a relationship of faith with him as a person, almost nobody is able to let it go at that. Hmm. You almost always proceed directly to think about what you believe in. And that thinking inevitably ends up producing theological models of various kinds, some of which are more hazardous to the gospel than others. Just covered this yesterday in uh, confirmation. Yeah, in regards to? Baptism. If you believe okay. and are baptized, you will be saved. And I said the old Adam always hangs on if, the new man in Christ always hangs on will, and then we get the if always attaches itself to believe. Well, what do you believe? Do you believe enough? Do you believe the right things? How do you know you believe? 
what do you believe? How do you believe yeah. it? <laughs> and, now, you didn't, and then you're like, uh, I, I, I can't get baptized. <laughs> right, right. Whereas um, I think the, the scriptures are blessedly uh, ambiguous about which comes first, right? Faith or baptism. Correct. Right. Well, that's they, why they just I, go together. Yeah. Yeah. My right. homework for the kids was they had to go home and watch YouTube and watch Schoolhouse Rock and Junction Junction. Because uh -huh. <laughs> they didn't know what that was. And I was like, well, first so of all, you're supposed to understand the and if you've never watched the cartoon. Uh, so go watch it. <clears throat> but I'm like, the old Adam's terrible at grammar because and joins two things together. It doesn't separate them. Well, and then there's the second clause. But do yeah. not believe and, and you're condemned, you're right? Condemned, exactly. You're like, oh, wait, no, wait a minute. Why didn't you say baptism in the second half? Well, because Correct. if you believe you're going to be baptized, it's good. they go together. Exactly. They just, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I gave you a gift, and there's a whole bunch of other gifts with your name on it under the tree. Are you going to just stop at the one gift, or are you going to ask me for the rest of the gifts that I brought? Right. That's baptism. Yeah. It's like we, well, the analogy and, that was used by somebody else, too, is you come out of the desert after 30 days in the desert, and you're thirsty, and I give you a shot glass full of water. Are you satisfied with that? No, of course not. You want more water, and sure. I've got it. So you demand more water. When someone says, do you believe, you're like, yes, I believe Jesus Christ is my Savior. Would you like more Jesus? Well, I mean, I, I think I've got enough. I'm good. I, I'm, I'll stand on this. Or so, no, until next week don't. anyway. Yeah, right. Yeah, until next week. No, <laughs> you want more, more Jesus. The, like in faith, here's, the, here's what you hear in faith. How many times can I get baptized? I want more baptism. You're like, one's good. Are you sure? Good. Yeah. And you're like, Here yeah, we do. we'll do this other. saves you. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll absolve you. Thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I've got this other thing and it's much better than water because... Get kind of a good buzz off of this one, if you. Oh well, there's that too. Well, and the, and I, that's why I asked you what you did because obviously baptism yeah. is we we use that technical word sacrament right. or or mystery mm -hmm. to attach right. to it because mm -hmm. it isn't it isn't rational, right? No, <laughs> it's not reasonable. Yeah. You can think about it as much as you want, and there's certain mm -hmm. things that you can think, uh, you know, that I think you know. Well, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but the sacrament of the altar, I, yeah. I see, I, I, I fell right into it. I was going to say think and think and then, think, yeah. okay, whatever. Yeah. Um, sacrament of the altar is the same way. It is, right? right? And that was Luther's emphasis at Marburg with, uh, what's his right. name? You know, to say is means is. Wow. Is means is. Let's, that's a, why do we need to go farther than that, yeah. right? Right. But but I think you can apply this. I mean, really, the life of the church, the life of the Christian is is full of mystery, like, well, what about a guy standing yeah. up and saying your sins are forgiven? That seems a right. little, like, weird. Really? <laughs> oh, no, yeah. that can't be. No, yeah. that can't be. Or, like, us gathered together around God's word and, and right. his gifts, that, that's that's a, that's going to constitute my entire the entirety of my life. It's going to change the way I understand everything. Right. Yeah. Uh, how? Yeah, it does. Yeah, give it time. It does. It Holy does. Spirit will do his work. It'll be fine. Right, exactly. Yeah, so that's why repentance in the way of the gospel toward the cross is repentance towards grace and forgiveness, mm -hmm. not away from it. And to acknowledge, oh, we've started engaging in a transaction here. Right. I do something for you, you do something for me, I pay for this, you give me something in return. Well, the word services. that comes to mind to me is rationalization, right? Self-justification, yeah. but rationalization, yeah. right? Trying to, trying to understand yourself and everything apart from what Jesus says. Uh, doesn't go yeah. well. You know what it always reminds me of, and this is so completely off, like th even for me, this is super meta, is uh, Winnie the Pooh, actually. Because <laughs> I have okay. kids. Every time Winnie the Pooh has a problem, what does he do? He sits down on a log and he taps his head and says, think, 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 <laughs> think. And he never That's... comes up with the right answer. He never gets it right. And when he does come up with an idea, it's terrible and it always backfires. And that's why all of his friends have to come around him and give him their advice on how to do it best. But he just, he's like, I don't know how to do this. And he's like, oh, bother. And he sits down, he's like, think, 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 think. And that's what it's like, like watching someone trying to figure out like forgiveness. It's like, you're just sitting there tapping your head, trying to think of like how this works. And it's like, there's no answer. This side of the resurrection, there is no answer. It's a mystery. Yeah. Embrace it. Enjoy it. It's fantastic. There, there's a, actually a lot of good, good theology in Winnie the Pooh. There kind of I, is, yeah. I don't know A.A. Milne. I don't know his history. I, I, I heard uh, somebody told me in Bible class on Sunday that um, he really re regretted writing it. Um, what? Yeah, because it ended up, he, he wanted to be a more serious writer. Oh, and, okay. And it, and it kind of took over. Um, but I always use a, a, a scene where uh, Pooh says something like, um, 
what does he say? Like, I've, I'm poor and deluded. I mean, he's just he's just sitting under the tree. And you're like, yeah, that's mm -hmm. exactly the human life, right? Right. right. Is that you've deceived yourself, you know, and you don't right. even know what's true anymore. Well, and if you've read The Giving Tree, then him sitting under the tree saying that makes mm -hmm. even more You think the tree is not immaterial to that, huh? That's correct. I'll yeah. fill in the gaps for you guys. Don't worry about it. <laughs> we see the cross everywhere. Give us. It's true. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. So what happens then is you proceed directly to think about what you believe in. And then you ask, well, do I believe the right things? Do I believe enough? Do I have the right kind of faith? What if I believe the wrong things? Who's going to correct me? Who has the right let's, faith? Let's, let's institute some safeguards and checks yes. to keep yes. me from getting off, getting out. We'll right. call that a creed. <laughs> yeah, we'll call that a creed. It's a good thing. Creeds are good. If they're I like creeds. Biblical. And again, clear away everything that stands between you and the Trinity. Otherwise, they're just a theological model that needs to be thrown out with the rest of the trash. You might not, you might be referring to one of the ecumenical creeds. I might, <clears throat> at least one of them. Accordingly, let me illustrate the dangers of theologizing theolo with two models. Close <laughs> a enough. bad one. You like that? <laughs> I did that. Glossolalalalalalia. <laughs> with two models, a bad one based on transactional imagery and a good one based on the mystery of Christ. In both models, you start with the same fundamental thought developed out of your act of faith in Jesus and your reading of the basic assertions of the New Testament, namely that God takes away the sins of the world in the death and resurrection of Jesus. So far, so good. But then if you keep on thinking, you will inevitably come up with some questions. How does the death and resurrection how? of Jesus? <laughs> yeah. How now, brown cow? An event that on the face of the biblical narrative happened some 2,000 years ago, make itself operative in your life here and now on the brink of the 21st century. How indeed is it operative for anyone in any age? What have you handed yourself by raising these questions? You see, is the job of constructing a theological model of the way that the divine operation works. Yeah. <clears throat> I would say, in my experience, hmm. past almost 30 years, that when I butt up against people that have very, very rigid theological models within which they work, uh, there's usually a conflict that, <laughs> that erupts, uh, primarily because I'm constantly working towards freeing myself from those things and simply, again, accepting the, the mystery. Right. Say what the Bible says and just let, let it be that. Right. And recognizing Christian freedom, we have certain rubrics, cer certain rites and traditions that are neither here nor there. They're simply a matter of Christian freedom, and we use them, we employ them for good church order. Yeah. Because left to ourselves, we're still sinful, we're still selfish. Left to ourselves, we're going to invent a whole bunch of stuff to basically domesticate God and put him back on the leash for our benefit, we think. Now, in, in one sense, I mean, we kind of badmouth the creeds a little bit. I mean, and you could do, I've got like four shelves over here of dogmatics, mm -hmm. you know, which is a fascination of mine. I, because what they seek to do is try to say what the Bible says and only go that far. Correct. Uh, but, the, but the challenge is, of course, same with the creed, is that in the process of trying to defend <clears throat> the scripture against error, yeah. you, you might get a little afield, right? And say things that the Bible isn't actually saying. Right, yeah. Or... You know, I mean, ultimately, I, mean, I talked about this in Bible class yesterday. I mean, you can't help but then import like philosophical concepts, for example. Correct. You know, from 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 Greek philosophy in particular to try to you know define things like homoousius, right? Mm -hmm. That one substance from the Nicene Creed. And you're like, that's n yes, we can co-opt it for Christian use. That part I don't have a problem with. But on the other hand, it does come with baggage, right? And mm -hmm. it, is it is it the <laughs> Does it really get to the heart of things? Does it really confess what we're trying to say there? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. And yeah. and then most people, when they confess the Nicene Creed, they're like, of one substance with the Father. Like, I don't know what that means, but I'm just going to say it. Right. You know, so it doesn't actually then serve the purpose of defending right. against error anymore because we don't even know what the word means or we don't even know what we're trying to say there. Right. Yeah, so it takes on a life that, of its own. Do you think I, that the common person on the street in like 610 AD understood what that meant either, though? Well, they fought over it, and some of them to the death. So not people I, on the street, people in the church. Oh, church the theologians. Did. Yeah, church. Yeah, theologians did because they were bored apparently. <clears throat> but people on the street, no. But I don't. do want to fly. I do want to flip the script a little bit and say, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, 
I, well, I, I appreciate like the simple childlike faith. And, mm -hmm. and I think that and that is what Jesus calls us to. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, you know, I do think, you know, we want to wrestle with scripture and, and dig deep. And sometimes, yeah. um, you know, trying to wrestle with like, well, how, how is it that, that Jesus is both God and man? Right. And, and how does that like play out in the narrative of the scriptures, mm -hmm. the, the New Testament, the gospel? And you look at it and like, yeah, it, 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 it's nuanced, right? I mean, you've got God in the flesh, sleeping in the boat, but then waking up and then stilling the storm, which only God can do. And right. there's this, um, it's like, he's not fully, God, he is fully God and fully man, but he doesn't act that way all the time. And so, you know, um, that's, that's a heart, that's a mystery. It ultimately is a mystery. Mm -hmm. Try to comprehend it and try to put, give some categories and some words to understand that. I don't know that mm -hmm. that's a problem. No. Well, I think the problem that we have is that the New Testament never attempts to philosophically mm. break up the mystery. Instead, what the New Testament does is, as I've said before, the New Testament is just a commentary on the Old Testament. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. It's just a yeah, commentary yeah. that says, hey, turns out, yeah, it actually was about Jesus, and here's why. <clears throat> Whereas going forward, you have a, a society in Greco-Roman society that's more and more disconnected from Scripture, from Israel, from Judaic tradition. Mm -hmm. And rather than then go back to scripture, they go to the philosophers, Plotinus, Epictetus, you know, Origen, others. <clears throat> and as a consequence, you get off the, you get off the beaten path rather quickly. Well, I think, I think a good that, example of this, mm -hmm. a good example of this that I hadn't uh, caught before, but it's in first Corinthians, is that when, when Paul makes the statement about preaching Christ and him crucified, mm -hmm. that comes in order. In, in timeline that comes after the Areopagus in Acts. Mm -hmm. After he tried to defend the faith by saying, here's your unknown God, but he never yeah. confessed Christ, actually. Right. Um, the, and Paul, Paul regrets, actually, I mm -hmm. think the opportunity, right? And he's saying, and this comes out of the fathers, the fathers recognize this too, but I think it's right, is to say, no, actually, I, arguing from philosophy that is trying to dissolve the mystery into yeah. rational, you know, reasonable, rational right. thing. No, I needed to actually, I had to, that was the place to do the stumbling block, right? Mm -hmm. The rock of offense, the scandal, yeah. right? It's to say to them, the God that you, this unknown God is actually Christ and crucified the one whom you killed, you know, mm -hmm. and go all in yeah. rather than kind of, for lack of a better way of saying it, like pussyfoot around the subject, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. 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 And you see Embrace that the mystery. <laughs> and then the further away, <clears throat> excuse me, the further away we move from the Greco-Roman philosophical tradition in the present tense. Yeah. Now, again, you have a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, and it degrades every time we move a further, a generation away. Because we're not taught philosophy in school. Like, I was taught philosophy because it was a part of my ecosystem and a part of my group of people, and then even in mm -hmm. seminary for both good and bad, my systematics professor that I was an advisee for, that I worked for, just fed me philosophy and forced me to read it. Um, but over the, like, since then, I've not really encountered very many people who have read enough philosophy to be able to say, this is what this is. This is why this is positive or, or a detriment to our confession. And so it's not even expected of you anymore coming into the ministry that you're familiar with philosophy so that when you read such terms as homo usius, you at least mm -hmm. know where it originated from and what the original argument was about. Well, and I, th I think this, was it on the show? I don't know, these shows go so long, I can't remember what we talk about before we go on here. <laughs> right. um, but just talking about new, the neutrality of a tool, like philosophy, yeah. I mean, yeah. philosophy is a tool. It can mm -hmm. be used for good, it can be used for ill. It can lead you right. away from faith, it can lead you into faith. It can help right. lead you into faith, right? Just come alongside the gospel mm -hmm. and actually say, you know, I mean, because frankly, like grammar is a, is a kind of philosophy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, philology, so, we've talked about Yeah, this. it's philology, right? Yeah. So you, you need to, un yeah, you need to understand words and, and word construction and word order like we were doing with the, the Hebrew earlier. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise, it's not as comprehensible. Right. But it's about comprehending. It's not necessarily understanding. Right. Which, is there a distinction between that? Yeah, I suppose there is. Comprehension is you're maybe. grasping something and you're able to actually work with it and use mm. it okay. correctly. <clears throat> understanding is simply saying, okay. You yeah, have to stand authority. under, right? Yeah. So the kind of model you build from this point on, however, will depend very much on your answers to some prior questions. Questions you may very well have answered already by going along with certain assumptions based mm -hmm. on a transactional model you have never consciously criticized. A priori, they say, mm -hmm. right? A priori. Not a city in Illinois, by the way. 
<laughs> you may have assumed, for example, that because the gift of grace in Jesus' death and resurrection is something you receive by faith, this gift is something you do not have until you have until you make the act of faith. In other words, you may have assumed that the gift starts out by being in one person, namely Jesus, and not in anybody else. And that it enters the lives of other persons only after the completion of some suitable transaction on their part. And this assumption, if you continue to hold it, will lead you down the garden path to a theology that is clean contrary to some of the most fundamental points in the New Testament. Oops. Mm. Because, despite the fact that both the Epistle to the Romans and the Epistle to the Galatians make it quite clear that the gift of grace operates by faith alone, not by works, you have, for all practical purposes, converted faith into a species of work. You have turned it into something that needs to be done before the gift can, in fact, be bestowed. For example, faith without works is dead. James. James. What people want to do then is turn faith into a work, because apparently that's easy to do when you don't make clear distinctions between faith and works. Right. Rather than saying, well, what if faith is the root and works are the fruit that the tree produces? Arguably, that's actually what James says in James chapter 1, which comes before chapter 2. Yeah. It, it is arguably what he says <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you just go back and read the previous chapter, you would fully understand what he says in chapter 2 right. about faith without works. Yes. <sighs> is that one that has faith naturally produces works like a tree produces fruit. <laughs> Yeah, it's there. Right. Yeah, it, yeah, I just... Well, and I think that's why Luther changed on, on James, in that he actually read the book, uh, whereas his initial criticism wasn't actually having read the book, but he, mm -hmm. like like Capon's uh, critique, he came to it from that, um, you know, L uh, Lombard sentence kind of methodology, right? right? Where, yeah. you, where you know all these little quotations from all over the place. Yeah. It's kind of like, like if you read the confutation, Rome's response to, to Melanchthon, you know, to mm -hmm. the Augsburg, you read the computation like what wait a minute you're quoting yeah. all these texts that really don't fit mm -hmm. i mean on their own they seem to be right. to make your point but it, mm -hmm. have you actually read those books that's not actually <laughs> right. what this is about yeah right and that's melanchthon's critique over and over and over mm -hmm. you know in his response it's like right. guys you you need to actually read the rest of the context right it's like they had a biblical thesaurus on the table <laughs> and it was divided right. topically like roger's biblical thesaurus and they're just like <laughs> what are we arguing about right now apostasy turn to a what what bible verses oh okay <laughs> and then they just right and they have so they have all these quotable texts mm -hmm. um, but they, they've a priori you know mm -hmm. ahead of time already assumed they understand what they mean without right. actually reading the, the, the whole argument right. yeah from the actual text a priori always reminds me of peoria illinois that's why i made that oh comment. i see where you're going with that i was yeah, like sorry. What? Peoria. That was, that was super that was super inside baseball for me yeah that's what i do that's where my brain jumps to that's so, okay. and, but he's also working from Romans and Galatians too, which we all know how troubling those texts are for theological models. For everybody. <laughs> yeah. Well, not for everybody. <laughs> for those of us who spend an inordinate amount of time reading Luther's Galatians commentary on this show. <laughs> yeah. And then, and the greater Galatians commentary. Yes. We did. Like Some what, 20, like 20 weeks, 25 weeks, I have Something no idea. Like that. Yeah. How many times too? I mean, we went back to it and did it again. <laughs> yeah. Can it, can't get enough of that super golden crisp. You have turned it into something that needs to be done before the gift in fact can be bestowed, which would negate Ephesians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually, again, the first chapter of James, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. Exactly. And that in turn, yeah. And that in turn leads you into frank opposition to all the assertions in Jesus's parables and in Paul's writings. And in the formularies of the church, for that matter, they clearly say the gift is given without any conditions at all. You have said, in short, that it must be earned. But Jesus says, for example, in the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, Matthew 20, that the reward has nothing to do with merit. And Paul says, for example, in Romans 3 through 5, that a person is justified without works, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And the Nicene Creed that says we acknowledge one baptism, not a bunch of subsequent transactions <laughs> for the forgiveness of sins. One and done. Oops. Oops. <laughs> well, how many, t I mean, at least in my experience, those who, who have this transactional view, even of baptism, yeah. don't actually confess the Nicene Creed. 
We that came up yesterday too because I asked. I have so many new kids in confirmation now that I got to review everything because. Oh yeah. Kind of like with this show, you're like, did I say this already? Do we talk about this already? I so can't I ever up, remember. Yeah. Why do we say the Nicene Creed every Sunday? And everyone's like, uh. <laughs> Because we do. I'm like, why do we do it? I'm like, well, because in the early church, the Nicene Creed was referred to as the Communion Creed. Sure. I'm like, that's why, you know what those two middle candles are on the altar? Those are the Communion candles. When you walk into church, if they're lit, that means the Lord's Supper is being served today. And then third, you know what else is a big tip off? There's bread and wine on the altar. Yeah, right. You know, but those are the three big tip offs that you're going to be in the service of the sacrament today. The Nicene Creed, the candles, and the elements. And those little things, as simple and as, I don't know, throwaway lines as they may seem to us, hmm. for kids and their parents who are sitting there have never heard it, there's like, oh, that just became the most important thing that we do on Sunday mornings now. Because now they understand why. Yeah. And they've never been taught why we do it in the first place. And don't it's why and it's not how. Correct. Right. 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 You know. Well, how yeah. is it? Well, I don't have an answer for that. Right. Well, that right. actually, that question did come up. How do they get lit? And I said, well, I have these two angels that light them. And then everyone laughed because it's, <laughs> you know, it's my council president, my elder, who are old, crusty uh, gentlemen, <laughs> who are the farthest thing from angelic that you could possibly imagine lighting candles, you know. But uh, <laughs> shout out to Jim and Doug. <laughs> but uh, no, it goes to the point, baptism now saves you. It's for the washing of regeneration, renewal, and it's the Holy Spirit's work so that yeah. no one can yeah. claim this work for themselves. Right. And the fact that Jesus commands it means you can't claim that for yourself. Faith comes through hearing and hearing comes through the word of God. The, even well, that's... if you believe and are baptized, even the belief Jesus already, you know, we're already told straight up, Jesus is going to give you a messenger of the gospel. And then Paul right. just like, this is how it happens. Through hearing the word of God, you come to faith. So by assuming that you believe and then if you want to, you get baptized, undercuts the whole work of, the, of God's word of to course. create faith in the first place and then to drive you from faith to, I want more of this, give it to me. Maybe we, we need to spin out one other idea here, which is um, mm -hmm. you know, how God actually commands the reception of a gift. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, well, because, wait a minute, if it's a well, gift, why does he have to command it? Because we are recalcitrant asses, as the formula of Concord says. Yeah, exactly. The, the, Love the that old quote. Adam, the old sinner, is a stubborn mule. Mm -hmm. And when given a gift, we'll say, well, I didn't ask for that gift, and it's not the kind of gift that I would ever accept anyways. So it's, here's the gift, and then... Correct. You say, oh, that was a gift. Even right. though you told me I had to do it, but now right. I recognize, oh, it was benefit. It was for my right. it was for my blessing. I think that works right. the same way with the Ten Words, right? The Ten Commands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like we look at them as gifts, but I mm -hmm. suppose to those who are who are put under the thumb, so to speak, by way of yeah. command, right. you know, I mean, I think they're not they're not perceived as gift. I mean, even something right. as simple as the Sabbath day, right. right, or being able to call on God's name. You're like, right. yeah, you know, you have permission to use His name, and it's a good thing. Right. And you're like, no, you just told me I can't use it in the wrong way. Well, right. no, that's true, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Yeah, but he but he gives it to you as a gift to be used rightly, and right. you know, according to His promise. You're like, but oh, we will not use yeah. it rightly. But, it's impossible for us to use it rightly, and therefore, something right. has to be done to intercede on our behalf. Well, and so this is running with with you know Luther's. I don't say it's an innovation, but I think his recognition. It's certainly is one of his unique contributions. Mm -hmm. um, is to say, well, another way to say law and gospel is to say command and promise. Correct. Right, and so you look at it and say, well, why would you attach a command to the promise? Because mm -hmm. because acknowledgement of your sin then leads you to the reception of the gift that right. forgives sins. Well, and to use Paul's own language, when, when God comes to us to give us something that we don't deserve, we treat him as an enemy. Hmm. And that's the purpose of Jesus' death, is to reconcile us with God. I suppose this, this, this bears out in our practical experience, right? People say, well, yeah. I don't accept charity. They're like, Correct. look, I just want to love you. I want to help, help you out. Oh, dude, like, the number of times in the past three months I've scolded my congregation for not taking free things just blows my mind. I'm like, there's free food downstairs. It's for you. If it wasn't, God would not have given it to us. So stop with the false piety and go downstairs and take the food home. Right. Like I literally, I had to command, and Steve can testify to this, I've had to command my church to take free food home and eat it. Isn't that incredible? And you're like, but, but what if somebody else needs it? I'm like, that somebody else is you, Jocko. Yeah. Like you. That's why it's yeah. here for you. 
If it wasn't right. for you, it wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here. And no, I would be for saying the, this to you. It's for the poor, starving kids in Africa. <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> Yet it's in your church basement. <laughs> yes, exactly. Somehow, God will transmogrify <laughs> that food across the ocean. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, but, but it, it, isn't that a great example of it, though? Right? I mean, there's a so gift and you can't receive it. Yeah. Right. Well, but we didn't do anything for it. Yeah, that's kind of the point of a gift being a gift. But like, to use the analogy of the bride and the bridegroom, mm. Jesus comes to us and says, I want to marry you. And you're like, well, you better put a ring on this finger first then. So then he goes and he brings a ring and we're like, not that kind of a ring. I mean, look at the size of that. That's not a real diamond. I mean, my friend Nancy, look at the size. I mean, she got an engagement ring from her. I mean, that's just a huge diamond. I mean, he obviously loves her. Blah, 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 blah. And then Jesus is like, take the ring. Do you want to be married or not? We're getting married. Like, I already paid for the reception hall. I paid for the catering. I bought the clothes for everybody. I invited all the guests. We're getting married. This is the uh, Edward Rojas, his paintings. Um, yes. you know, sometimes they're a little childish, but I love the one where it's he's R-I-O-J-A-S, dragging... R-I-O-J-A-S, by the way, if you want to R-O- go look him up. Rio uh, where, Rios. Rios, yeah, where he's dragging the coffin out of the ground. It's the best. That's my favorite Isn't that one. something? Yeah. It's like, because that's, I mean, he drags you into the kingdom, <laughs> yeah. kicking and screaming. You're, yeah. Like, wait a minute, it's all a gift. It's good, right? Everybody we were talking about that in a while, but if, if Lutherans did that um, Footprints in the Sand poster... It would be two, a set of footprints and then drag marks. <laughs> just grab you by the uh, by the hair and just drag you. Scruff your neck. Dug in, yeah. No, that's 100% what it... In fact, somebody needs to make that poster. I need to Same commission him gave to me the do Nietzsche some... And the pa- <laughs> whoever did the, the Nietzsche and the clerical collar, I can't remember, but shout out to who did that. That was fantastic. Uh, do the same thing with uh, Jesus dragging us down the beach by our, by our hair. I guess he does great. secular art too. He doesn't just do religious art. I should have him do some stuff for coffee. That'd be fun. Right? Commission some art. Yeah. But yeah, go check out Rio. His art is amazing, by the way. It's just... Yeah, I'm going to link to I the love website it. here. I'm it's trying to find style. that one. It's very distinct. Yeah. Oh, here it is. Uh, for... What does it say? What's the text? It's the parable of the buried treasure. For yes. joy, he went and sold all that he had and Correct. bought the field. Yeah. Right? And so the field is a cemetery outside yeah. of a church. And he's yeah. dragging the coffin out of the field. Yeah. How's that? That was Paul. Thank you, Paul. Paul, are you lurking? Were you lurking this whole time, Paul? Yeah, uh, apparently so. How dare you, sir? I thought we were all friends here. <laughs> no lurkers. There you go. Hopefully that link works, but that gets you to the website. Anyway. There we go. Speaking of lurkers, the team that made Left for Dead has got a new video game coming out, Dead Before Dawn. Super stoked for it. Anywho, back to the point. <laughs> um, this is what we do, though, with all of God's gifts is we treat them like either A, I have to go off and and like earn the right to this gift, which would upset the parable of the prodigal son, that he forgives you before you confess. Um, Or we reject it altogether. Worthy preparation is, yes, Mm -hmm. et cetera. Yes, he He is worthy worthy and prepared who believes these words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. For whoever believes these words has exactly what they say. Um, And we take that simple little phrase by Dr. Luther in his catechism, whoever believes these words has exactly what they say. And then we say, yes, but do you understand these words? Uh, yes, but. Uh-huh. Do you do you live these words? Have you experienced these? How do you feel about these words? Are you sure? And we turn it in. Again, that's a transaction. That's the very nature of a transaction. God does something for you, then you have to do something for him in return. Prove it, right? Exactly. Hence the, and, just uh, the like r- a good, r- and just like anybody who receives a gift, I have to then up the ante for my return. I can't just give you the same gift of equal or lesser value. It has to be of equal or greater value. So uh, this is, I guess this is a good way to... called like, the uh, the merry-go-round. This is the way to diagnose confirmation, the right of confirmation, mm-hmm. is that we give God all sorts of things, and he doesn't give us anything that we didn't already have. Correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, well, wait a minute. Then what is it? Is it transactional? Yeah. Uh-oh. Let me Did give back to that? you this, this candy dish that I never really liked. This is I'm going to give back to God this candy dish. Regifting? I'm going to regift. Yeah, I'm going to regift her. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's like the jerk, the movie, when he leaves the house and he's like, "I don't need anything except this thermos <laughs> and this remote control and this this thing." And he, he just keeps grabbing things as he's, he's like, I don't need anything except this and this and this and this. It's like you're giving back to God what he already gave you 
Why would he want it back? Take my heart and let it be. Okay. See, now. <laughs> it's an earworm. I'll give you that. It is. it is. So I would say go back, read this for yourself a couple times if necessary, because the rest of the book hinges on this understanding I think of so. transactionalism. Yeah. And it wrecked me. I mean, if you've read my book, you know I cover it, this in my book. Um, and it wrecked me when I read it because I recognized through that that that's, that's in the entirety of life is transactional. We, we live our entire life in terms of transactions. And to a large extent, we have to. Like, you know, I go to the store. I can't just walk out of the store with a grocery bag full of food because I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. No. One, I'm not loving my neighbor. <laughs> and two, obviously, I'm violating the command. So, yeah, we do live transactionally. The problem is, for us, is that we drag it into church with us. The one it place that true. it's not necessary. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this we, is but, why and, and, covenant and I think, theology is so dangerous. When left and it's untracked. not just our standing before God. I mean, I think it also spins yeah. out in how we relate to one another in the church. No, 100%. And we, because we live the rest of our life transactionally. Right? Well, I was going to say, Steve and I had this conversation after jujitsu last night that I just accept people for who they are. I don't have expectations of people anymore. I honestly, I just don't. And if I do, I squash them. I just push them down because they're not relevant. And I'm trying to, essentially what I do is when I, when I have expectations of people, what I'm really doing is saying, well, do you remember the last conversation we have three months ago? I'm going to mm -hmm. treat you like that person rather than a person who's changed since then. So you have to go back three months and be that personality that you were three months ago for this conversation to go forward versus... Is that possible? <laughs> no, it's impossible. That's why it's right. so unfair and irresponsible and unethical. So I squash that because it's not real. It's me. It's ego. It's sin. And rather, I just accept you for who you are in the present tense. And then I make a judgment based on the conversation or our interactions in the present tense. Mm-hmm. And the reason then is because I don't see this as a transaction. You're free to do that. You probably do. I don't. I know I'm going to get something out of this. I just don't know what it is. And to be blunt, that's kind of exciting, actually. That's the mystery of relationships is every morning I wake up, my wife's a different person. And therefore, I get to every day, I wake up and I get to ask the same question. I wonder um, what our, my love for my spouse is going to be like today. Yeah. Because I have to learn to re-love my wife today. I have to re-establish my love for my wife today because she's a different person than she was yesterday. And especially in marriage, for example, if you've been married as long as we have, 24 years or so, um, which, oh, thank, good reminder, I have an anniversary in like 12 or 13 days, 13 days. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not that guy. I actually do know when I got married. Because uh, <laughs> we were supposed I'm to get married doing during the, the I'm doing the opener. mental math here. <laughs> well, we were supposed to get married on the fishing opener and all my relatives are like, we won't be there. I'm like, Really? Really, I'm the favorite grandkid. Really, you won't show up because it's fishing opener, and they're like, "You can put it off till the next week." I'm like, "Fine, fine, we'll do that." So that's why I don't forget, because yeah. my relatives are a holes, and um, so we've been married. And I could either say, "Well, she's you know, Annie's the same person she's always been. She's the same. She's the person I fell in love with the first time I saw her." That's true. Whatever makes Annie Annie is the person that I fell in love with 24 years ago. However, she's a totally different person than she was 24 years ago because she's given birth to five of my demon spawn. So there's right. that. And then all the other things that have happened to her as an individual in her whole life with and apart from me. Well, and I think so, it's more than that. <clears throat> Why don't you apply Cape into this and say, I mean, exactly. in a real sense, she's a mystery. Yes, that's what I'm saying is that every morning when I wake up, she's a different person, which means she's a mystery. And then I have to ask myself again the question, you know, is this the person I love? Why do I love her? Um, what do I love about her? And most of that's a mystery. I can't actually tell you. If you said, and I've brought this up on the show before, whether you love your spouse, girlfriend, boyfriend, your kids, your parents, whatever, take away everything that they do and don't do for you. That's the mm -hmm. transactional part of this. Take right. all of that away and then describe for me why you love them. You can't. And yet you know that none of what the doing and the not doing is why you love them in the first place. That's the mystery no, of love. No, because if it were... Mm -hmm. You know, they, you know, both sides of the equation fail. Correct. Frequently. <laughs> Which is why marriages fail, I think. That's why. Oh, because they look at it purely transactionally? Yeah. Correct. What did you, what have you done for me lately? Versus mm. who are you? Two different questions. It is, absolutely. 
you. All right. And I was saying even in the pew, it's this way too, mm-hmm. that we look at each other like, what can we get out of each other? Exactly. You know, pastors yeah. do that with congregations, which is yeah. terrorizing them right. or turning them, turning them into just utility, which is, yeah. Yeah. you know, for their own You're self-esteem. Yeah. Right. Or just, which, yeah, like you said, it's just an ego boost. Well, like I said earlier in the show, you know, thinking about children, the delightful thing about children is that, um, you know, like that clip you sent me about, uh, um, what was it? Education. Um, Oh, how, the educational system has changed. The Common Core system is what we call it today. But Common Core is, uh, oh, not a not object based education. What was it? Outcome based. Outcome based. Outcome based yeah. education, right? Mm-hmm. Which is that's one hundred percent transactional approach right. to a child. Right. We need to turn you into something that's a utility. Exactly. Um, to, if you to want to stay. go on to fourth grade first, you must pass through all of these checks. Otherwise, otherwise, you're no longer useful to society. Correct. Right. And the and test. Like, that, a, the example that she cited from the test was. Every answer, except for one, was yes. And the purpose of these tests that these kids took was to weed out the nonconformists and then target them specifically to make them conform. Wow. And Through I don't know how much... I, th- I, th- I think Common Core is a tempering of that because they recognize mm-hmm. they couldn't go all in on, on uh, right. outcome-based. Well, it's but... very... Yeah, that's why pe- some people refer to it as Communist Core. The lowest common denominator kind of idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's very Just... communitarian for sure. Like and in one sense, I understand, understand. you know, because mm-hmm. we homes we've always homeschooled, but we've we've also had like here are some basic things that we like our kids to be able to be able right. to do and to think and to know, yeah. right? And so there is a core. I get mm-hmm. that, um, but it's also not programmatic. It's like some of Correct. our kids are better at math than others, and yeah. we honestly don't care. Right? And we we work at it. We try to help mm-hmm. the ones that aren't as good to improve. Right. But they may just not be in a field that requires math or in a vocation yeah. that needs math because they're just not good at yeah. it. So they're not qualified for it. Right. It's like, how is that so terrible to say to a child, you know, no, you must meet this level of expectation right. or there's no place for you in our society or there's, you can't. Right. It's like. Postman talks about that in The Invention of Childhood. No, that in right. pre-industrialized society, if you had a baby with Down syndrome, for example, there was plenty of work on the farm for somebody with Down syndrome. Sure. But then the more, um, the more technological innovation in filtrated society, in industry in particular, there were less and less jobs for a person with Down syndrome within that society because wow. the jobs became more and more specific. And to, uh, you know, you have to learn how to run this loom. You have to know how to wire a house. And even on the farm, you have to know how to drive this tractor that now has a motherboard in it. These are not things then that somebody with Down syndrome can do. So then what do you do with that person when they're not a part of society anymore because you basically limited their access to vocations? Well, you put them in a nursing, you put them in a, a home for people with Down syndrome, and then you let other people take care of them. Right. And we have all these negative terms. I was, I was listening to a... Um, Same with the elderly, uh, by the way. I was, yeah. I was listening to a podcast um, and the host, it's, it's a mm-hmm. political commentary podcast. Uh, it's actually a uh, video show as well. I mean, they, they're live and whatnot, but listen to it as podcast form. Either mm-hmm. way, the host was like, I haven't used a computer in 10 years. I'm mm-hmm. like, what? He's like, <laughs> right. he reads the papers. Who, he actually gets you? papers in the mail. Wow. They deliver, they drop out. He reads like, you know, all the, all the big press. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't read them online. Mm-hmm. It's like, and how could you be a successful podcast host today if you're not right. using all the digital stuff and everything? Right. It's like, I honestly don't care. Right. I, I read that. I read this. And that's something. It's just yeah. like, and, and you can have, uh, what do you want to say? Credential, notoriety, mm-hmm. success, ultimately, yeah. without being highly technologically engaged. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's fine. You just read yeah. stuff. Yeah, that's why I like. You know, my office is kind of like I'm a super techie, but then I have all these print books around me. It just makes keep, keeps me. Uh, what do you want right. to say? Uh, in conflict with myself. It, it makes you look like you're still part of the guild in full. Oh, I see. So it's all optics. I got yes, it. Okay. 100%. All your trophies behind you there, making you look. Smart. No, the ones behind me, these... the ones I use almost weekly. Well, I'm saying though, the stuff that's behind me is like, what are those? Oh, that's all like my ordination stuff and like, you know, my credentials. So when you walk in my <laughs> office and talk to me, you're like, um, excuse me, uh, I'm super important because I got this stuff on the wall behind me. And they're looking at me and they're like, dude, you're in a tank top with tattoos. <laughs> and I always you haven't talk shaved about this. in forever. <laughs> like... I, I, finally, I finally put up my... Uh... Cert- <clears throat> Master of Divinity certificate, there but you go. I, I had I kept forgetting to take it home, and I had it mm-hmm. sitting in my my office. I was in graduate study, yeah. and I at some point I set my coffee cup on it, so it has this big coffee stain right on nice. it. Nice, perfect. And I'm like, 
it's just like it should be it should be pristine and it, it has a coffee stain on it that's that's like, the way it should be treated it should be a coaster because that's what it's its value is less than the cup of coffee you put on where, it. i spent a lot of money on that what are you saying it has no value real. All my diplomas are behind my TV <laughs> on this filing cabinet. Oh, that's great. But all of the, we're talking about, we're having fun at the end of the podcast, but really all yep. of this is, is just, exp these are all examples of the problem with transactional, living transactionally, is that in the end, everybody is going to be reduced to the lowest common denominator. And the way that one goes about doing that, if you want to do it quickly and efficiently, is through fear. Because right. fear and insecurity are the easiest way to manipulate people. This is, again, proven by fear by history and experience versus freedom, which is I just get up on Sunday and I say, here's all the evil crap that's standing between you and Jesus Christ. Right. I'm going to point it out. I'm going to kill it and with the word of God. And then I'm going to point you to the altar, come up here, eat and drink Jesus Christ, and then go and live your life in freedom. And people are like, uh, but what about everybody else? I'm like, don't worry about everybody else. Can't do anything about them. Can they do anything about that? Invite them to church, by the way. Preach, preach right. about Jesus to them. You, you know, I think if you, you want could, to share your I, hope in Jesus Christ, go for it. And it's it's probably the most, I don't know if it's the most, but it's certainly an effective tool is if you live your life differently. And that, that does have an impression on people. They're like, mm -hmm. why, why do you live that way? Why, why, why do you not, you know, why do you yeah. have this freedom? Why do you act mm -hmm. as if you're free? I'm like, because mm -hmm. I am. Yeah. You are too, by the way. I'm like, really? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know? You know? And yet, act like it. <laughs> as it comes up over and over in relation to fear in our Sunday morning Bible study, they use their freedom to go back to the penitentiary. How does, how does the themselves. apostle say it? You know, do not use your free as a cover for evil. Yeah. Free, or use your freedom for a cover for evil. Mm -hmm. Like, really? But again, that's in, that's in that naughty book. Oh, the is it? I don't like to talk about. The, the letter of freedom. The epistle of freedom, as it's called. Yeah, right. We well, and then what's, what's a cover for evil? What's evil, right? Well, then we have to define that term. Well, he doesn't Right, book, exactly. But, yeah. Yeah. Which, by the way, you can because we spent a couple podcasts. Oh, we did that. talk about evil. I remember that. Did. Yeah. Episode 200, 201, probably. Yeah. So I got nothing. I had nothing else to talk about on that topic, unless you do. <laughs> like, you want to read the next few pages and go for another hour. But I really oh well. do. I want to strangle it to death. <laughs> but, um, we're in an hour 46. It doesn't get old. It doesn't get old. It's always no, good. Cape and never gets old. On this topic is particular, the giftedness mm -hmm. stuff, because it's yeah. it's 100% like, um, uh, what do you want, almost 100% um, compatible with what we confess as Lutherans. Yeah. Right? It's definitely it in the is. Reformation tradition. Yes. And yet it's so like, I mean, we bump into how many Lutherans even who mm -hmm. just don't, don't right. view what right. they give, what they receive in the church as right. a gift from God. Yeah. Well, because the institution transactionalizes everything. Yeah. And so if you're going to participate in the institution, you either succumb to that, or you figure out how to exist within it while yeah. not being fed into it. Right. Because right. that's what freedom of Christ does, is it it leads you away from that. It doesn't lead you into that. Just to enjoy and enjoy each other's company exactly. and what, what we have gift. and what we and can recognize do. Yeah. we're surrounded by institutions. We can't escape the institutions in our lives in any way, shape, or form. But we can recognize that that's what they are. They're institutions. Right. And they have a certain ethic and a certain way of doing business. And when you're a part of that, you're going to be basically compelled to do business and to participate. But that doesn't mean that you can't recognize the gift within the institution. Right. Right. And, and just say like, okay, I recognize this packaging is a part of this institution, but the food that I'm getting through this from the packaging is still good food. But I have to recognize I could grow this myself in my garden and I'm doing all this extra stuff because that's what the institution's taught me to do. Sometimes Florida the packaging store. indicates that what's inside is not good for you. Yes. Correct. More often than not, I would argue the packaging is is the tip off of Wait like. Does that danger. look like a pepper? No. Okay, <laughs> exactly. then it probably isn't. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Yes. It's like yeah, it's like the like you know herd immunity versus well, if you're vaccinated, that's herd immunity. You're like, I don't think you understand what the what herd immunity means at that point. No. It's like, this is a pepper. I don't think you understand what a pepper is. <laughs> you know who created herd immunity as a, to as a definition? Who's up? Pharmaceuticals. No kidding. It's not a real term. Yeah, they made yeah. it up. There we go. I like it. To encourage you to. That was probably the most important thing we said this entire podcast. And it's, it's during the bump music at the end. I just so thank you everybody for listening. As over always, over. Uh, go check out 1517. We held up all those books. Go buy them. Go donate. Uh, email and tell 
demand that we uh, tell the 15 and 17 that you demand that we talk about more Two Kingdom stuff on this podcast and we address social issues and current events more often. Otherwise, uh, we'll just keep on plugging away talking about Jesus. So, because it's well, all good. We're going to do that either way. I know we are, but okay. You know, good. <laughs> groundswell, viral, grassroots support, whatever you want to call it. So, thank you to everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Peace. There we go. There we go. Turn back on Dropbox. There we yeah, go. I got to do that too. I left it on, unfortunately, for a while. There. You, I was probably yeah, blocking. You, you for froze a while. up a couple times. I just assumed yeah. it's because you were. Then I was like, oh, I forgot that. Well, that's true too, but I had forgotten to pause Dropbox myself. Cool. Which only and for affects what you on the see. Live stream, I did an interview on Friday with Michael uh, Cusina over at Spotter Up, and he's got a podcast called The Whole Man Podcast, and he interviewed me about uh, faith and spirituality, but also about being a whole man in relation to faith and belief in God. And so, not a partial man. I thought it was a good conversation because I basically just I, we just talked a lot about body, soul, and mind being what makes a person a person, and why it's important that we hold that in mind when we're talking. Not only oh. about this is a new mm-hmm. podcast. Yeah. It hasn't. Yeah. He, so he's re- pre-recording a bunch of episodes, but it hasn't hasn't broadcast okay. yet. That would okay. probably be why he hasn't tagged me. This is Bethel Church, Twin View Campus, Redding, California. Okay. Oh, really? Is where they meet, where the, where the group meets, the whole man project. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Oh, yeah, Mike's a Christian, and uh, he's super disillusioned with the church, as many are, um, and feels like maybe he doesn't belong in church because it really doesn't address where he's coming from as a man, as a vet. Um, and so we talk about that basically. Sounds like, like I said, sounds like an interesting know. project. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Just reading, it's not, reading about it on the website. It's not one of those things where it's like, Hey man, this is what a real man is like. It's more along the lines of like, let's talk with different men from different walks of life, but all kind of swim in the same pool, the same ocean, right. um, about their perspective on being a man, but being a man of faith, being a man of action, being a law enforcement officer, being a rescuer, whatever it might be. And so that's kind of why I came into that because I had done a podcast with them for Spotter Up. No, I think that's helpful. And I just, you know, we started off with it and we kind of ran with it. It's just like, you know, um, because we don't address the whole person, body, soul, and mind. Right. We don't then recognize that the detriment of one aspect of what makes you you affects the other two. So right. again, if you if you don't exercise and you're lethargic and you put garbage in your body, it does actually affect the way that you think. And it mm-hmm. leads you to make bad decisions then, which contribute to further physical um, degradation. But also then that affects your soul because that's really your life. Your seat of your life is your soul. And, you know, modern psychology has replaced t- talk of the soul with talk of personality. <clears throat> and so, like I said, you know, a veteran comes home and he's diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, that D at the end of it means it's a psychological malady versus... No, his soul was touched by death and evil. Mm, mm, and mm. that's not something that you can fix by going through therapy and counseling. That can be one aspect of it, but that's not going to heal your soul. Right, because there's um, actual a spiritual distress there. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so by psychologizing something that's a spiritual affliction, you're actually making it worse. Because well, we have now it's going to go a... untended. I asked, I asked for suggestions and of course the only suggestions about like things that we could try doing that would be fun mm-hmm. and interesting you know or beneficial to people mm-hmm. all the suggestions come from the new members they not yeah. not any right, this yep. is not surprising i suppose yep. but the new members want want they want comprehensive you know they they want they want the scripture to interact with the rest of their life yeah. so they're like you know we want to do a thing where we read like you know classic books mm-hmm. one of them suggested like read like you know, like we do on the show, basically, but mm-hmm. the same yeah. idea, you know, or like maybe read, have a book club where you do this one. Oh, you can't read the title, mm-hmm. but it's Chairman Mao meets the Apostle Paul. Yeah. Christianity, communism, and the hope for China. Right. I right. actually brought it to church because I thought we might get to it at some point. Nice. I, yeah. It's, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. But uh, a lot of background knowledge is to understand maybe Mao. Maybe that could and, be our summer book do that at the end of prophetic May. realism in of pauline ap- ap- apocalyptic the anti-utopia and post mao china hmm. de-eschatology in in really Maoism. well now you get yeah. my attention canonized thoughts of mao hmm. and paul nice yeah relevance like of pauline eschatology in response to cultural millenni- millennialian worldview i mean that's all big huh. language but i was gonna say yeah. is, is that a dissertation that got turned into a book 
Um, I don't think so. The Taoist mm. understanding, of, or Taoist, whatever, Taoist yeah. understanding of death, mm -hmm. which would be good. And then now how that... My wheelhouse. I, actually, I think this is... I think they are just... It must be a collection of essays. They're just short. Oh, even better. Yeah, because it's very short. What, note on style. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, let's do that. We'll read that for our, our summer book list. Well, we should probably understand our new overlords, right? We should. That's for sure. I mean, they I mean, own us one along, way or another. To get along and go along, we should, yeah. Or not, as the case may be. Ah, oh, well, but it has end notes. Talk to talk. Come on, why do you do end notes, people? <sighs> note to note notes. to everybody out there. Don't do that. Footnotes. Footnotes. Foot, footnotes. I know it's less readable, but <sighs> it, you know what? In ebook format, I have no problem with end notes because they're hyperlinked. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. <laughs> but. Come on, man. Anti-utopia in post-Mao China. I mean, that just sounds fascinating. I just want to read it. It does. That. Yeah. Because, yeah, Plus, I think we can Obviously, in America, we're past that utopian dream of the, Amer of the American dream. Suicide cults and Pauline eschatology. Ooh. What? what? Nice. <laughs> wow. Wow. It's kind of like the COVIDians nowadays is a suicide. I called them a doomsday cult yesterday, but suicide cult works too. Yeah. Because you're willfully participating in your own demise. Huh. Well, how's that? What's that have to do with China? It's a, it's the very last thing he ends on. Huh. I don't know. Procol Harum. <laughs> 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 wow. Well, it's, huh. it's this whole, th well, you know, uh, uh, the CCP is, is obviously mm -hmm. a uh, multinational criminal organization, but um, including and death here. Cult. The world and a largest. death cult, right? But it is based upon this utopian mm -hmm. vision. Yeah, um, I think it's I think it's utopianism uh, co-opted by uh, greedy capitalists. Yeah, which yeah. is usually how it works, right? Yeah, you get but a that's psychopath. A whole subject. Right? Who really I mean, is just trying to get ahead? <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's like I know I'm a psychopath, but that doesn't mean I can't have nice things. Yeah, well, it's kind of how it works. I'm going to be the only one who has nice things. Correct. Exactly. At the end of the day, that's really what it comes down to is why only, why just annihilate you when I can take your stuff too? Well, I'll read through it and then we'll, I'll maybe highlight some things that we can look at. Paul we'll says it sounds like a book that was made for us to discuss. I agree. Communism hey, as a religion? To... What? Ooh. Well, there a we Maoist cult? Question mark? And done. <laughs> and done. There we go. Religious phenomena and function of a Maoist cult? Oh my gosh. Yeah, this is perfect. I like it. This was right. Uh, we didn't read the listener. review. We, we didn't read the review. Oh, from, yeah, we'll from have to do weekend. that next time. All we, right. we received a tremendous, uh, yet somewhat deflating review that perfectly <laughs> encapsulated our personality. I put it in, in like, the, uh, I put it in like the Telegram group, though. 30 words or less or something. It's like, no, you actually I think you nailed I, it. That was, that I, was good. I, I think I put it in Telegram. Cool. Statement from Donald J. Trump, 45th president of the United States of America. The fraudulent he presidential our podcast? Yeah. The fraudulent presidential election of 2020 will be from this day forth known as the <laughs> You froze. Lie. <laughs> so <laughs> they're calling his contesting the election the big lie. So now he's gonna call <laughs> the, election. the election itself the big lie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I miss the trolling. I miss the trolling. It's so good. Yeah. yeah. Oh, epic troll. I mean, this guy's me on Twitter, <laughs> so I guess adopting communism isn't that bad. <laughs> Welcome to America. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, we should all right. We're going to take off from here, guys. So thank you, uh, men and women, ladies and gentlemen, for being a part of the podcast and the live stream and all you do to support us and... Uh, yeah, you know Telegram. Go find it. If you're not there already, you know. It's a wild, like, wild west. I was going to say, ban that's like banned books after dark is the Telegram. Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Page. So, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, uh, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.